Well, 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 Clemson Tiger fans, college football fans, welcome back to another episode of the All In Show right here on the Voice of College Football Clemson channel. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm always your host, Tiger Paul Craven. Got a lot to talk about tonight. Got uh, injury updates. We have come to the end of spring. The spring game is this Saturday at 1 p.m. in Death Valley. Um, and tons to get into tonight about uh, all of that stuff and, and a couple things in the around college football as well. Uh, but before we get into tonight's show, um, if you are not subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button for us. Uh, we are quickly approaching the 5,000 mark, um, not too many more, and we will be over that threshold. So help us out with that. Uh, help us get to that 5,000 subscriber mark, and that would be greatly appreciated. And as always, this is a live video, so hit that like button while you're in here. Get into the um, chat section, uh, ask your questions, get your thoughts out, uh, let us know what you think. Um, and then last but certainly not least, if you would like to support what me and Jordan do right here on the Voice of College Football Clemson channel, go ahead and hit that super chat button. Uh, not only will it support what we do here, but it'll also guarantee that your comment or question gets highlighted during the live show and responded to by both myself and Jordan Bowman. And with all of that said, without further ado, let me bring on my co-host, Jordan Bowman. Jordan, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing doing pretty good, man. Um, it's been a pretty eventful week, a lot of anticipation. You know, I'm still recovering from the uh, the, the basketball team and Obviously, the the great run they had, and the, you know, coming to an end. Uh, but it's been it's been pretty good. You know, just a really fun time in Clemson athletics. Uh, baseball team is is cooking. Softball team not so much, but all in all, we're <laughs> we're, we're 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 getting through it. And um, you know, this is one of my favorite times of the year. And you know, this the, the spring game is a chance to you know see a lot. You, you finally get to stop talking about stuff that you. You know, you're you're listening or in hearing about it, and you could actually get to see some of these players on the field, and you know, it's it's just a it's a fun time. So, uh, I'll, I'll, this is always one of the dates I look forward to when you know actual football is not being played. Yeah, man. Look, it's it's always fun to get to this point in spring where uh, you know it finally comes to a culmination uh, that ends in the spring game, right? Um, we hear all the reports out of practice and, you know, we hear coaches talk and players talk and, you know, this person looks pretty good. That person looks pretty good. You know, this person's progressing how we want them to. Um, but the good thing is this time of year, we finally get to see it in the Valley um, with fans in the stands and we get to see exactly how everything looks uh, a true view of it. Now with that said, obviously it's a spring game. It's not the end all be all. It, it's not going to be a carbon copy of what the season to come will be. Uh, but it is somewhat of an insight into, you know, how this team looks, at least early on. Um, you know, is there any growth in the in the different places where we obviously need to see growth? And, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But, you know, really excited for the spring game. Kind of bummed. I won't be able to make it to the spring game. Uh, but, you know. I'm sure there's going to be a ton of Tiger fans there. I know Dabo Sweeney mentioned in his interview yesterday that he was looking for Clemson fans to show up and show out, which they always do, and pack the Valley. Um, he said pick a side uh, and then pack the Valley. So I know all the Clemson fans will, will come in and, and show out and do that. Absolutely, man. It's, you know, it, it's – like no other. I mean, Clemson, you know, I've never had to worry about over the years about Clemson, you know, show, you know, showing out for a, a spring game. And I think they've, they've got it down uh, to a T, um, you know, just, you know, it's, it, first of all, it's free. So, you know, anytime you get free football, it's hey man, it's you want you want to take advantage of it. Um, hey, especially, I won't, in Clemson, especially in Clemson, man, them, them, them tickets ain't cheap, man. No, no, they are not. It, <laughs> it, it costs a small fortune, you know, if. If it wasn't for student discounts and so over the years, I, I would have been, I would have been in some deep water. Uh, um, but no, but seriously, it, it, it's it really is a, a different uh, experience. So if you guys have a chance to go, then, then go. I, I, it's funny we're we're both encouraging this because neither one of us will, will be able to make it on on Saturday. But um, 
it still, it, you know, it, it's it, seriously, it's it's one of the best times of the year. And if you are an avid Clemson football fan, and you know you have the opportunity to go, you know that's you know I, I always say you should go because again, it's free and also um, it's a lot of fun, and you get to interact with a lot of you know other fans, and it, it's just kind of feels more like like you're you're back in the fall again. Yeah, absolutely. And at this point in time in the season. Uh, or the off season, I should say. College football fans are just starving for anything football. So regardless of whether it's a spring game or whether it's a real game, the, these college football fanatics like us, we're going to tune in. We're going to be excited about it, and there will be a ton of people that get there. Uh, unfortunately, me and you will not be one of those people that will be in the Valley this Saturday, but I know it will be a good time. And um, – with that said, let's go ahead and get into the show tonight. And and the first segment that I kind of want to do tonight is talking about Dabo Sweeney and his um, spring update interview. You know, we we heard from Dabo Sweeney yesterday for the first time since they broke for spring break. Second half of spring practice is now in the books. I think 14 practices in. You know, we're going to culminate with that spring game come Saturday. But he had a lot to say about this team and about some of the gross that growth that he has seen. Um, you know, he talked about the growth uh, at the QB position. He talked about how, you know, he went about splitting up this team for the spring game and how West Goodwin and, and Garrett Riley are going to be the two head coaches. And he kind of split it up and um, it's talked about a lot of different position groups and, and guys that he has seen positive things from this season. Um, so what were your kind of, overall thoughts on kind of how Dabo Sweeney addressed the media and his thoughts on this team thus far and, and where they sit uh, come, you know, now we're at the end of spring practice. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, he, you know, you know how Dabo is when you, when, when uh, he does these types of interviews, you're always kind of like, uh, man, what is he, is he going to, you know, say more or is he going to, you know, is he going to delve into, you know, questions that, you know, we, we all are asking, or is he going to kind of give the same kind of, you know, you know, coach speak and, you know, this guy's doing this and, you know, this guy is, is improving and, and, and all of that. Um, uh, but one thing he did uh, mention that really stood out to me was just the, you know, the fact that this is the one opportunity they get uh, before the season to really, uh, create a game atmosphere and, and all that, which is why it's important that, you know, Clemson fans show up. Um, and, you know, he brought up how, you know, there's 16 mid-year enrollees. Like there's a, a lot of guys um, that that potentially Clemson could be uh, relying on in, in some uh, form or, you know, respect during the season that haven't had that game experience yet. Um, and so, you know, this is, uh, our first opportunity to really get a look at them. Um, and, you know, he spent a lot of that press conference more so talking about um, those guys and, and just some of the, and, and also the, the, the players that aren't going to be able to play at all. Um, so, you know, it, it was kind of a, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, well, we have all these injuries, um, but, you know, it does give you an opportunity to see a lot of the guys, um, a lot, especially a lot of the younger players and players that don't, you know, play particularly as much, um, you know, they'll be in more increased roles. So um, really interested to kind of see some of those, uh, some of those players, a lot of the ones he mentioned, because he, he talked up a few. Yeah, absolutely. He definitely, uh, you know, mentioned quite a few by name and, and, and said a lot of good things uh, about a couple of the, uh, the players that that I'll be keeping an eye on, you know, during the spring game, and and hopefully we see, you know, some of the stuff that that he he talked about. You know, we'll see, you know, how much of that is coach speak, how much of that is, you know, legitimately the progression that has been made throughout this spring. That's to be determined, right? At this point in time, um, and yeah, that you, you mentioned one of the biggest things that that he kind of harped on specifically early on in his interview was you know, the fans coming out and creating that environment, you know, specifically for those mid-year guys, right? Those 16 guys that are going to be participating in the spring game that, you know, have never played a game in Death Valley or really, you know, 
in an environment, you know, like Death Valley. So um, we all know that, you know, college teams, they don't get any preseason. They can't scrimmage another team. They can't, you know, there there is nothing like that. So they kind of, you know, the spring game is what it is, and they have to make that um, the best they possibly can to get some game-like reps for specifically those young guys. But but other guys, you know, he talked about other guys that are going to be feeling, you know, more significant roles this season and and how they would respond and how they would be able to to handle their new roles in that environment as well. Some guys that, you know, maybe haven't gotten as many snaps, uh, you know, maybe they've been on the this team for, you know, a year or two, but they haven't gotten the snaps uh, in live games that you would like them to. So this will be important for those guys as well. And and you mentioned one of the big things that, you know, we kind of have to, uh, to, to cover now. That's, um, you know, all these, all these injuries that are, you know, reported for the spring game. You know, we talked early on in, in spring Jordan about, you know, how much better we were from an injury standpoint heading into spring here. We sit at the end of spring and there's, there's still a pretty lengthy list of guys you know, some that we already knew prior to spring starting that were out, but we got some new injuries as well. And some guys that are that are kind of banged up, some guys that will probably be held more because of precaution and because it's a spring game versus, you know, they truly couldn't play if they had to, um, you know, but there there's a pretty a lengthy list of guys. And, you know, Jaden Lucas was the first one that Dabo Sweeney mentioned. Obviously, he had to have shoulder shoulder surgery at the end of the season. Uh, So he is still out. Cole Turner, who was out for majority of last season um, after that abdominal tear that he has. um, Now he's got another strain abductor muscle um, that's kind of limiting him and he's not going to be able to play in the game. Walker Parks has obviously been out since last season. Uh, He's still, you know, working back from that injury. Dabo did say that he got some individual drills and and some team drills in, but he just obviously wouldn't be available for um, full contact scrimmage yet. So that's a good thing that he did get that individual work. Same for Ronan O'Connell. He had a surgery coming out of high school, a previous injury. Um, he got a little bit of work as well, just not going to be a full go for the spring game. And then Tyler Brown, uh, his foot injury, right? Uh, obviously he had that surgery you know, doing a little bit better, said he's running routes on air and stuff like that. So I guess that's encouraging. We all know what Tyler Brown can do. So I don't think we necessarily need to see him in a spring game to really know what Tyler Brown can do. Um, Jay Haynes, who me and you talked about early on uh, when we were kind of previewing spring practice and talking about various guys that we were looking to kind of make those leaps and make those jumps into the next season, Jay Haynes was one of the ones that me and you both mentioned, you know, sort of the top of our list when it came to running backs, not named Phil Moffa. And unfortunately for him, he pulled a hamstring during Matt drills and really hasn't been able to bounce back since. So uh, that's unfortunate for him because, you know, I think he had, you know, and even Dabo said he had a big, big opportunity this spring. And unfortunately because of injury, he just hasn't been available and hasn't been on the field. So, um, Peter Woods, one of the more shocking ones, I think, to all of us Clemson fans. I was I was really excited to see what Peter Woods be, would be able to do at the defensive end position, but he's got mono, um, so he can't play. Uh, Vic Burley battling a hamstring. Uh, Ricardo Jones has a fractured foot. Um, Corey and Gibson still recovering from that ACL surgery that he had back in high school. And then uh, Noble Johnson, obviously, still not cleared to play, so a pretty lengthy list, Jordan, of injuries that and guys that will not be participating in the spring game. What are your thoughts on that extensive list that I just rattled off for the last 10 minutes? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's it's unfortunate because, you know, a lot of this list is, is is guys that we've talked about at different points, of, you know, during the spring and, you know, f- for one reason or another, Clemson is going to, you know, need them to be at, you know, 100%, you know, come the season and, you know, they're expected to be, you know, at least contributors within, uh, you know, at their respective positions, like you you mentioned, 
Um, obviously, Peter Woods, you know, mono is not going to be a long a long term thing. But, you know, we all wanted to see him and, and how his transition to defensive end was 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 working. I mean, we we know how good he is. I, I always thought, I mean, he I mean, he played edge at, at times in high school. I mean, they, they played him all along the defensive line. And, you know, he he for someone who projects as a defensive tackle, he's got a really advanced uh, bag as far as his pass rushing moves. So, I mean, I always thought that that move was was something that he could make a transition he could make. Uh, but you know, again, just uh, this, that's that's just luck, uh, you know, un, you know, bad luck, you know, just to get mono right before um, or right before the spring game. And especially since, you know, he's at this point, he's good to go. He's recovered. But, you know, there's a there's a gestation period where you don't want to um, you still have to be careful and, and, and not, you know, put yourself where you could potentially spread it. And so it's. Um, you know, that, that one's just unfortunate and, you know, he's just such a fun player to watch, but then you, you look at the, the wide receiver position. We talked about Tyler, we, we, Tyler Brown is kind of a known commodity at, at this point, but we, I mean, I wanted to see how, you know, Troy Stilato looked and, um, you know, it, we, we thought he may, he had some really nice moments, uh, during the year last year when he could, could stay healthy and we, we expect him to take that, uh, that next jump. And then, you know, Cole Turner is a guy that we, all I'd hoped would be a bigger part of the offense, but injuries, of course, limited him as well. So I, I kind of wanted to see, you know, at least two or th- two out of those three guys uh, being able to play, especially since all three of them are, you know, more slot types and and, and guys that we expect to, to do a lot of their damage um, in the slot and, and, you know, down the field as, as playmaking threats, you, you know, you just, is for an offense that needs to get more explosive, like you need those guys to to be playing at 100. Uh, percent So I wanted to be, I wanted a chance to see them. So that sucked. Um, Vic Burley, uh, he just hasn't been able to get right since he's gotten here. You know, it's just, just been one thing after another. Um, obviously, tore his uh, ACL last uh, last uh, last fall. Wasn't able to play at all during the year. He's as I mean, I, I think he has a chance to really, you know, have make an impact this year. Um, I think he's too good not to play at at at, at some point. Um, it just the yeah, he's he came in about as ready as as any of the freshmen not named Peter Woods, and he just the the injuries were obviously unfortunate. And then you mentioned Jay Haynes. You know, where that RB two discussion has been ongoing. Like, who is going to really step up there? I mean, Keith Adams is the is the guy that's been in the room a long time. He's reliable, um, but you know, you always wanted to see like Jay Haynes was was always an intriguing prospect when when Clemson took him, and we saw some some glimpses of his ability at at times in, in garbage duty uh, early in the season, and so I wanted to see how he looked in a in a full spring game setting and 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 what his. Uh, you know, what his potential outlook is because, you know, the, the staff seems to really like him and, and Dabo has talked him up at, at multiple points during the spring about what his his potential is. So wanted to get a chance to see him. And then Ricardo Jones, one of my favorite freshmen in this class, um, I wanted to see him play as well because he's, you know, he was coming off an injury at, from high school and um, still want to, see, you know, I wanted to get a chance to see him in action because I think he's a fresh one of those freshmen that is, uh, well beyond his, uh, not well beyond his years, but I think he he you know, was a guy I felt pretty confident would come in and, and show out right away and uh, just really productive in high school. And I felt he was underranked, you know, coming out. Um, so wanted to get a chance to see him. And uh, obviously we talked about, and, and you also mentioned Walker Parks. Um, and, you know, I, it's good to see him starting to, you know, take strides and make progressions. Uh but obviously won't be able to play, you know, play during the spring game. And he's a very important piece of this offensive line uh, in 2024. So um, I'm trying to think who else did you mention? Corian Gibson, another one of my, yeah, I really love this defensive back class in general and, and Corian Gibson and Ricardo Jones were, were definitely the headliners for me. Um, so happy to hear that he's starting to work his way back. I uh, wish I, we, we had, a, we would get a chance to see him. And then, you know, Noble Johnson, I just I just need him to recover and, you know, hopefully put, you know, you know what happened behind him, Um, because, you know, I I still you know, I I know there's you know, the wide receiver room is kind of uh, crowded right now. There's a lot of bodies and, you know, there's going to be a limited amount of snaps. But I want to I want to see him get a chance at some point. 
um, you just kind of see where, where he he's at. Uh, him and Ronan Hannafin, you know, came in this, you know, at the same time. And, um, you know, we've, we've seen Ronan at different points, but, you know, neither one of them we, we, we've seen a whole lot of. So it would have been cool to see them get some reps, too. Yeah, absolutely, man. Look, it's some of these injuries, some of these guys not participating in spring is is somewhat disappointing. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is a spring game. These guys, we need these guys for the fall. We need them for when these games actually count. So if they need to sit out and continue to get healthy and, you know, that sort of thing, I think it's a small price to pay to, to not see them in a spring game so that they have the potential to truly contribute when it matters come this fall. So, you know, like I said, pretty extensive list, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think we got a lot of guys that are still going to be playing that is going to be exciting to see what they do. And it's going to be exciting to, you know, kind of see, you know, how these teams shake out. And you talk about, um, you know, orange versus white. And er earlier yesterday, I think these uh, these rosters dropped. Um, and talking about the the orange versus white team rosters. And, um, you know, they kind of not only did so Clemson for those. I'm sure everybody in here knows, but Clemson runs their spring game slightly differently than some other teams run their spring game, right? So Clemson truly does split the team in half. They try to distribute the talent throughout both teams. They not only split the team, but they also split the coaching staff in half as well. So head coach for the white team will be Wes Goodwin. Head coach for the orange team will be Garrett Riley, right? So um, – the coaching staff has now been split. The players have now been split. Um, and, you know, we, we have the roster. So um, just looking at these rosters, Jordan, what were what were your thoughts? Any any anything stand out for you for these uh, these orange versus white team rosters? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, they they did their best to, um, you know, to try to split it even. That's that's just what, you know, they 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 try to get you know, a good mix of uh, good on good. Um, and I, I think they, they did that for the most part. Um, you know, I, they, they did a, I wish they had like denoted the players that weren't playing. Cause you know, on the, what, you know, for the white roster, for example, you still see Jay Haynes there. Right. He's not going to play. He's on the roster, but he's not going to play. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think they did a pretty good job as far as splitting the, the teams. Uh, you know, one thing that's interesting was Trent Pierman. Uh, obviously, since there's only there, we have three scholarship quarterbacks, you know, one of them is going to have to, um, and one of them is going to have to play uh, both sides. And, and Trent Pierman was that guy. Uh, yeah. And I think Dabo said they're going to ro rotate him in every third series. So you know that makes sense. So he'll have an opportunity to play with. Um, the white team, and then his next go will be with on the orange team. Um, so interested to see him because I I, I want to see kind of how the um, I kind of want to see like what his you know how he looks you know in a in game setting because you know they they talk him up about you know his you know he's a gamer and and all of that and he he just makes plays but you know mm -hmm. I was like well you, you also want to you want to see it. Um, but, you know, all in all, I, I think they split it up about as well as they could. I, I think um, I think the wide, team, wide, wide receiver yeah. is a little low yeah, for, for yeah, the yeah, orange yeah. team. Um, yeah, they, they kind of did. They, they did the white team a little dirty when it came to the wide receivers. I'm just saying yeah. uh, that orange team has got Brian Wesco, um, Antonio Williams, and Adam Randall. I think I think that's the that is the only position group that I felt like, ooh, so, like that, there, talk, there's, there's a very talk, clear difference. I mean, Adam, yeah, you mentioned Adam Randall, Wesco, Antonio Williams. Um, you know, Tyler Brown's not playing, but he's on there. Um, yeah, but, I mean, you and, just talk about those three guys. Those I'm assuming just looking at the roster, right? Antonio Williams, uh, Brian Wesco, and Adam Randall. Those are going to be the three guys that run out there first. Yeah, that's that's definitely. a. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good trio to run out there first. Um, you know, but you know, I'm actually I'm I'm actually okay with it because 
you know, I, I think one of the most important parts of this spring is getting Cade and, and, and these wide receivers to be on the same page and, and building that rapport. And these are the guys that I think are going to be playing a lot, you know. No, even, absolutely. Even a guy like, you know, you know Brian Wesco, who's come in as a true friend. I mean, I think he's – I think you have to play him. I think he's too good not to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm even more excited about, you know, when, when TJ Moore eventually gets in here. Like, that's – that's going to make for some really interesting discussions as far as the, yeah. the wide receiver depth chart and, you know, how those snaps are, are kind of split up. But, you know, keeping an eye on Adam Randall, of course, because I, I think he's he's the guy they really want to get going because um, this is a I mean, this is a big year for him, third year. And, you know, I, I think he you know, the hope is that he's finally shed, you know, the the, the injury bugaboos and and kind of sort of the the hesitancy at times that he's played with. And um I think they, they want to be able to expand his bag a little bit more too, because they didn't ask him to, to do a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as far as the variety of, you know, his routes and, and all that, I, hopefully we see that progression as well. Um, so I, I think building that rapport with Cade, with, with, with these guys, I, I think that was kind of um, what they had in mind. I, I think that was the, I felt like they really wanted to get, you know, those kind of reps because um, that's, that's the most important part of this offense being successful is being able to create those explosive plays. Like we haven't been able to the last three seasons. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to be key. And and if I was the coach, I would have did it exactly the same way. Like you have to get those guys that you think are going to get majority of the playing time this season. They got to be on the team with Kate, even, even if it's a spring game, you got to get those guys on there because these are game like reps that, that are going to pay dividends for you come the fall. Um, you know, so and it'll be interesting to see Kay Klubnik and, and Chris Vizina kind of duel that out. Uh, it's going to be fun. So it seems like every quarterback will get two series um, and then, you know, the next quarterback will come in. Right. So they got you said they got Trent Pierman jumping back and forth. So he'll get two series back to back, one for the orange team, one for the white team. And then, you know, so on and so forth, rinse and repeat, uh, depending on how many series we get. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Offensive line. To me, looks uh, you know somewhat um, even, but it seems that they got guys that I suspect will get majority of the playing time are again on the off are on the orange side of the uh, the roster. You, you yeah. talk about a, a Tristan Lee, um, uh, Ryan Lithicum, you, you know uh, Blake Miller. Uh, you know you talk about these guys that that you would expect uh, Marcus Tate. You know, guys like that, you would expect to get majority of playing time come this fall. They're they're kind of all on the orange roster. So what it kind of seems is they kind of put more so the guys that are expected to be starters for the Clemson offense on that orange team. Uh, yeah. Just at first glance, just looking at it, they, they kind of stacked it in that way. And then, you know, obviously on the defensive side of the ball, maybe did the opposite for – the white, the white team, team which, yeah. which is something that, you know, makes a little, you know, that does make a lot of sense, right? It's not necessarily straight up first team offense versus first team defense, but in a sense, it kind of is when you look at how they broke down the roster. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, they, they, they clearly wanted to get good on good. Um, well, uh, best on best is probably the mm -hmm. best way to say it. Um, Cause I don't want to imply that the, 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 the second teamers are, are, are bad or, or not good, but, um yeah i i think they they really want to you know they really want to see that competition um and you know it, it's not there's no coincidence that the the team with the more of the first team defense is being coached by west goodwin and, and right. the team yeah. with more of the first team offense is being coached by garrett riley um so uh i, I think they they really want to get you know their their best guys going up against each other and and, and competing constantly um and I think it tells you a lot uh, about kind of where they uh, view a lot of these guys. Um, mm -hmm. You look, uh, we already talked about the wide receiver room, but, you know, having Bryant Wesco, they, they, you know, they clearly think high of him um, to be on the orange team. And, you know, it's no surprise. I mean, they've, they've talked about how, you know, he's been everything that's advertised, but I think it's more confirmation that, you know, you're going to see, you know, a good bit of him during the season. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's exciting. Um and having Antonio Williams back is massive. It feels like I, I haven't seen him play a snap in forever. I know he played in the bowl game, but he wasn't 100%. Still made a couple of big catches down the stretch. But, um, 
you know, just getting a chance to see him back out there. And, and you know, I, it, it just it was so disappointing, you know, the way his season played out because he just wasn't able to stay healthy. Um, so getting a chance to see him and, and Cade and that connection again uh, will be a lot of fun. I'll um, tell you, one of, the, one of the other interesting things that I, I was just glancing at the rosters is they got Caden Story as a defensive tackle. So They do. Um, that's interesting. You know, we you, all this spring we've been talking about him and Peter Woods got moved to defensive end. But, you know, when you kind of look at this team roster slash depth chart for the orange and the white team, he's over there with the D tackles. He's not listed uh, as a defensive end for, for either team. That, that must be the it, I, it must be related to the Burley situation, him not being able to, you know, still not being able to, to fully go. But they and I, I know that they said that story. I don't think, you know, they story is uh, I think story has still been repping at times with uh, the defensive tackles. He's kind of been warming yeah. up with them. And but they they also. So I think that they've done the uh, the similar thing like they did with Peter Woods and that, you know, they still want him to get reps at, at both spots. Um, but, yeah, so I, I think that's interesting that he's. I still think it's really interesting that he's at uh, defensive tackle. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to see what else kind of stands out here. Um, they put it, it seems like they put the first team special teams together. Uh, well, no, that's not true. They they split the the special teams. They split the special um, teams. Yeah. Yeah. You have Nolan Hooser, the you know the true freshman for the uh, you know, the true freshman kicker. Uh, he's going to be with the white team, but then you have your first team punter on the white team as well, and Aiden Swanson. Right. Um, and then obviously it's it's flipped for the orange team. You've got uh, Robert Gunn, the the presumed starter, but you know there's still a competition going. It is, and Dabo mentioned it. And then also you have and then you have Jack Smith, the presumed you know second teamer and uh, a guy that I'm interested to see. You know how to how you know he's eventually Aiden Swanson's probably going to be gone after this year. I don't think he has any more eligibility. Um, yeah, I think he's he's done after this season. Yeah, so you know you want Jack Smith to take that next step. He was a you know he was a scholarship guy. Uh, coming out of high school, I think mm-hmm. a lot of people forget that. Um, so I, I want to see how he kind of progresses. Um, and, you know, that so special teams was interesting. Um, let's see. Anything else that stands out? Linebacker. Uh, um, linebacker, you know, you're it's Barrett Carter <laughs> for, for orange team and then you know, a bunch of, I mean, in D Creighton, but you know, who we haven't seen a whole ton of. Yeah. Um, a bunch of young guys after that, yeah, man. A bunch, bunch of young of, guys walk on. Uh, yeah. D, D Creighton and Jamal Anderson, but we haven't seen, you know, a, a ton of them. You know, right. obviously I'm, I have a lot of high hopes, uh, especially for Jamal Anderson. I loved him as a recruit. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they, Barrett Carter, clear, obvious leader in the linebacker room. And they, they, they stuck him with a lot of the younger guys. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, give him that leadership uh, role and, and kind of the same thing on, on the white team with Wade Wood as, and, you know, he's, you know, the other presumed leader in that linebacker room and you put him with Sammy Brown and Kobe McLeod, um, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to kind of split up, you know, split them up pretty evenly. Um, so they, they did their, their best and, and kind of, they, they, they'll be pr- the presumed captains, I, I, I guess, for, you know, their respective defenses. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, for sure. Those those two guys will definitely be the leaders of those defenses. And, you know, you can see the clear um, break and in, in kind of how they, they you know, s- separated these two teams, obviously, based off the coaching staff as well. So I think another interesting thing is, you know, obviously Garrett Riley working with majority of the first team offense over on the orange team and West working with majority of the first team that's on the white team. But one of the other things is Kyle Richardson will be calling the offensive plays for the white team. So I think that'll be, you know, an interesting thing to see. Um, you know, not that I plan on Garrett Riley going anywhere anytime soon, but it is always good to have some sort of secession plan or something in place should uh, anything happen. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to see Kyle Richardson and, and how he calls plays and, and what that kind of looks like. Um, and then, you know, Obviously, Chris Rump over on the other side with with Mickey gone. Those guys will be calling the defensive side of the ball for uh, the Orange team. So um, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, I think it's it's broken down as well as it could be. I think it makes sense the way that they did it. 
Um, and you know, we'll we'll see how it shakes out. Maybe maybe at the end we'll we'll make a we'll make a a little uh, prediction on which team we think is going to come out on top. Uh, the oh the yeah, orange, the orange or the white team. So so we'll we'll save that for a little bit later in the show. Um, but Jordan, let's go ahead and transition to um, actually before. Uh, we transition into our next topic. Uh, just to remind everybody, this is a live show. So if you guys could go ahead and hit that like button for us while, while you're in here. Also, um, if you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. Um, get your comments in the comment section. As you know, at the end of the show, me and Jordan will turn the show over to you guys for a little bit and let you guys get your comments and questions in and, and ask us what we think about the various topics you want us to talk about. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, if you would like to support what we do here, go ahead and hit that super chat button um, and help out what we do here. And then also there will be a 8 p.m. show um, on this channel. It'll be um, uh, it'll be Mark Rogers um, and Jason Priester here to break down the spring game for you guys. That'll be 8 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, Mark Rogers, Jason Priester will be right here on this channel live to break down the spring game for you guys. So uh, show up for that. Show uh, Jason Priester and Mark Rogers some love. Um, Absolutely. And you guys can chop it up about the spring game. And obviously me and Jordan will be back here next Thursday, 8 p.m. to talk everything spring game, all the stuff that we saw um, and, and everything like that. Um, but with all of that said, let's go ahead and transition back into talking football and let's get into the actual spring game and the spring game preview and, and things that we want to see and and um, various, you know, guys that, you know, we want to see how they develop. So so Jordan, obviously, we just went through the roster. It looks majority first team offense on the orange team, first team defense on the white team. So first and foremost, um I think one of the one of the big things is, you know, the offensive side of the ball. Obviously, there has to be a lot of growth. Um, we need to see growth specifically at the quarterback position. That's where it starts, but also at the wide receiver position. So um, let's talk about the spring game. Let's talk about, you know, let's start on the offensive side of the ball, and then we'll transition to the defensive side of the ball a little bit later. But on the offensive side of the ball, what are you looking for and – and what would you like to see happen during the spring game? Well, um, I, I think from the, from an offensive perspective, I, I think obviously I think you want the, the first team offense to look better. Uh, I say the first team offense, but the, the the orange team offense that has made up a lot of first team uh, players, you know, looking the best. Obviously, your starting quarterback is there. You know, a lot of the, the wide receivers you expect to be relying on this year are on that team most of the offensive line. Um, so you, you want to see kind of how those guys are, are playing together and how that that rapport is starting to be built up because we just – we really need to see, you know, that that progression. And, you know, it's, it's been – you know, the past few spring games, it's it's been a it's, – it, it's been a not so offensive-centric, um, you know, performance. And obviously it, it ended up being – you know, we – after every one, we'd be like, oh, you know, this doesn't, you know, mean too much. It doesn't necessarily mean we're, you know, the offense isn't any good. But obviously the the season. <laughs> Unfortunately, <followed> it. it did. <laughs> yeah, the season that followed it, you know, seemed to follow that same trend. So, you know, it would be nice if I came away from this game thinking, hmm, the defense needs some work. Yeah. I, I, I think that. And that's weird to say because Cle the defense has been a staple, of, you know, for Clemson, and, and during this run, it's been every bit as important as as the offensive success it has been for for Clemson and uh, you know winning those two national championships. But I really want to come away from this game saying, okay, well, the, the defense is we got some a lot, we got a lot of young guys and and it showed, but you know, Cade is you know Cade looks sharp. We hit some big plays. Receivers are look confident, look like they're having fun. You know, Garrett Riley was in his bag, you know, and I don't even mean like the, the offensive, all, you know, they, they pull out all the stops and, and, and you know, show the whole playbook or anything like that. But I just want to see, you know, some of this stuff start to look easy, especially the big plays and, and look like it's it's something that they're they're comfortable doing. 
because it just never felt like during you know last season that they were they were comfortable taking shots down the field and and you know that the timing was never really there. Um, so I, I want to see that um, first and foremost, and you know that that starts with Cade, but it also starts with the offensive line. How does how do we look at center? You know, obviously that's the, probably the biggest uh, point of contention for for uh, you know this offense heading into next year. You need to you need to make sure you have winning uh, play at center because if you don't, it's hard to do anything else offensively. Um, and so it, it starts with so it starts with center, it starts with Cade and kind of his his rapport with these wide receivers. So I kind of want to see that from an offensive uh, standpoint. And then, um, but I also you know for, from the white team perspective, I want to see how Chris Vizina looks because mm-hmm. you know we've heard all of the about the progression that he's made. Uh, during the off season and how they feel like he can he can actually come in and and, and play winning football now it was, it was let's see it and again spring games only mean so much can't you know take away you know everything from it but it would be nice to get some some sort of confirmation or or, or some idea that you know what the coaches have been saying or is holding true um so you know i, I really want to see chris Vazina and, and kind of how he he plays and you know how more more comfortable and how much more mature uh, he's gotten uh, from year one to year two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, you want to see this offense become more explosive. You want to see evidence that this offense has the ability to be explosive. I mean, that's first and foremost. And obviously, it starts at the quarterback position. You mentioned uh, both quarterbacks, K. Klubnik, Chris Vizina. We need to see both of these quarterbacks play well in this game, I think. Um Obviously, more so Cade Klubnik, you want to see some growth from him, right? Like, how comfortable does he look just operating within this offense? How comfortable does he look in the pocket? Is he seeing the open receivers downfield, you know, that are that are running open? Is he is he scanning the field or is he doing like he did for majority of last season, which is just kind of looking to one side of the field or just looking to one read and forcing the ball or you know, taking a sack or something like that. So you want to see growth from that standpoint. Obviously, you want to see his growth as a leader, right? Just just his body language on the sideline, his body language on the field. Is he in command of that offense? That's one of the big things uh, that I think I want to see from him. And then his ability to use his legs when needed, right? I think that's one of the things that he got a little bit better at later in the season last year, but we need to see more of this season is just Cade, and his ability to escape the pocket when necessary. And that doesn't always mean turning it upfield and running, but also keeping your eyes downfield for that open receiver, right? When you're doing scramble drill, when, you know, the receivers notice that quarterback's in trouble and they're trying to work themselves open uh, for a big play, right? Good Um, things happened when he did it last year. Absolutely. He he showed some more promise. He 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 makes good throws on the run. Absolutely. And and Garrett Riley talked about it in his interview last week, right, about how the last scrimmage that Clemson did, what did Cade do? He got outside the pocket, um, he moved, and then he hit a huge bomb to to Wesco. And that kind of, you know, as far as Garrett Riley told us, that kind of sparked the entire offense for the rest of that scrimmage, right? So it's it's seeing things like that happen uh, with explosive plays to follow. I think that'll be a huge. And then obviously just seeing Chris Vizina because we haven't seen Chris Vizina very much. Um, you know, obviously you saw him some in limited time in the spring game last year um, and then pockets occasionally, but you really haven't seen Chris Vizina. He hasn't really played a lot. Um, and Dabo kind of talked about that, how, you know, he just needed to get reps with competition going against the defense. Right. So how does he look? I know the coaching staff has talked at length about, his growth, but is, is it, is it really growth? Are they, are they kind of pumping it up too much? You know, how does he look? I think it's going to be important just to, just to see how he plays and how he operates. I mean, he has Um, to be, he has to be playable. I mean, you can't, you can't afford to have your QB two be like, okay, we, you know, I mean, we'll put him in if we have to, but right. You know, you know, fingers crossed that Cade stays healthy. Like if, if that's the situation we're in, that's, it's not ideal, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think the spring game could go a long way in telling us if that's the situation we're in, right? Um, because if it is, you don't feel great. Uh, even if Cade is, you know, lights out a ton better than he was last season, 
you're still one play away from playing your backup. So that person, you know, in Chris Rosina has got to be able to come in and at least play winning football for you. Right. Um, so I think it's a big thing uh, with the quarterbacks. And then obviously um, the guys are going to be throwing to the, the wide receivers. Right. What, what do these guys look like? We talked about, you know, last season where you went into a spring game and you had, I think, two scholarship wide receivers. Um, and it wasn't a great day for K Club Nick. It wasn't a great day for the offense. Um, you know, but how do those wide receivers look, right? I'm excited to see Bryant Wesco, right? Excited to see how he plays, right? Another guy I'm excited to see is Adam Randall. Has he taken mm-hmm. that next step, right? Has he elevated to the point where you're looking at him and you're like, yeah, this is the guy that we heard about fall camp number one when he was out here making all these spectacular plays that unfortunately we never got to see because he tore his ACL and then tore his other ACL and had two knee surgeries and, you know, hasn't quite looked the same since, but started to get there towards the end of last season. How does he look? I think that's going to be, you know, huge as well. Um, And then, you know, obviously another big one for me as far as the wide receivers go, and then I'll I'll let you talk uh, about the wide receivers, and and that is Antonio Williams. Because, I mean, we all know – the amazing season he had as a freshman, right? And then next, and then his sophomore season comes, which was last year. And, you know, the injury bug bit him early and it kept him down for majority of the season. We saw him, you talked about it in limited time in the bowl game, but he really wasn't healthy. He really wasn't himself, although he did make a couple plays. You know, what does he look like um, after a, an entire season of being injured? Uh, so I think that's that's some of the important things um, obviously for that orange roster and that orange team, but but just the offense in general. Absolutely. Is my mic muted? I hope not. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. All right. I wasn't showing whether or not it was muted or not. Um, but, no, you made some excellent points, and you, you kind of hit on the guys. Like you mentioned Adam Randall and, and Antonio Williams especially. Like those are guys that are, you know, they came in the same year and um, – one showed a lot more promise his freshman year than the other for obvious reasons. Uh, but, you know, they, they're both go- coming into their third seasons as, as, as Clemson football players. And, you know, it's all, always that, that third year for any college football player is a really big deal as far as, you know, the, the progression that they make and whether they're ready to take that next step. And both of them, and obviously Antonio Williams had just, he had a rough sophomore campaign and wasn't able to you know stay on the field. And, and that was disappointing because this offense definitely needed him at multiple t- points during the year. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, coming into this, this spring game, you, you want to see like, do they look confident, uh, you know, because they both have reasons to be kind of hesitant and, you know, just due to the, you know, past injuries and, and stuff like that. But, you want to see them kind of have that attitude and look like they are, you know, really confident heading into their junior years because they're going to be uh, extremely uh, significant parts of this passing game uh, this mm-hmm. year. So how does how, how does you know how do they look? Um, and then how do some of the younger guys uh, look? We, um, you know, some of the the second year uh, players. Uh, how does Ronan? Han- I, I mentioned Ronan Ronan Hannafin earlier. Um, want to see kind of how he looks. How does Cole Turner look coming back from injury? Um, you know, where are these, uh, um, you know, where's the explosiveness um, and where's the depth of this wide receiver room, uh, you know, going to come from? Um, so, uh, you know, that'll be interesting. I don't know. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of see how that that kind of plays out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'll, that'll definitely be important to uh... – to see how the depth of the wide receiver room, a, a, a name that comes to me is. Uh, I don't know why I said Cole Turner because he's not playing, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a name, a name that comes to mind to me is uh, Tink Kelly. Heard, you know, him mention a few times in interviews this spring about, you know, how he's kind of come along and and done things. So um, I think that's what I wanted to say, and I and I ended up saying Cole Turner. But. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, but then, obviously, keeping with the with the offense and 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 keeping the pace going, uh, the the offensive line. We have to see growth from the offensive line. I mentioned a couple guys. Dabo hit on um, 
Tristan Lay and uh, Blake Miller and said those dudes have become super consistent. Obviously, Blake Miller, uh, we know what he can do. Uh, he has solidified himself as the right tackle. Um, he, he's consistent over there. Uh, he plays well. Tristan Lay has apparently become really consistent this season, uh, found his voice, become somewhat of a leader in that offensive line group, which is great to hear. Um, you mentioned it earlier. One of the big things for the offensive line is this center position battle, right? And Dabo was asked about it, obviously. He said that if the game was played today, Ryan Lithicum would run out there as the starter at center. Um, mentioned, obviously, Trent Howard could probably start at guard uh, for this team, uh, but he was right there as well. And then Harris Sewell struggled a little bit early with the snapping, becoming a little bit more consistent there. We'll see how he develops, how he, you know, go into this transformation phase that Dabo likes to call it uh, in the offseason and see how those dudes shake it up. But uh, what are your thoughts on the offensive line? Who are you looking out for in this spring game? Who do you think could, um, you know, maybe catch our eye? Yeah, um, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the left tackle with with Tristan Lay and kind of what his, you know, how the progression that he's he's been making this offseason – you know, you, you really want to have a solidified starter there for sure. Um, you know, it's definitely been him and, and Colin Sadler that have been the, the, the main ones. And, you know, they, they split time uh, with each other last year. And at different points, you know, one played better than the other. Um, so you kind of want to see some separation there and kind of have that consistency at left tackle. Um, but I feel a little bit better about that position right now than kind of where, where, where center is. I, I feel like Lay and, and, and Sadler have definitely shown a lot more promise than maybe some of the uh, other guys uh, you mentioned, but uh, you mentioned Harris Sewell um, and, and kind of his, where he kind of fits into all of this. Uh, it, I did find it interesting that he is one of the players designated to play on both, both teams mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday. Um, and so it's obvious they want to get him a lot of reps Um where at, we'll see. Will he get some snaps at center? Will he be playing mostly guard like he did a lot of last year? Um, I, I kind of want to see, you know, where he kind of fits in because, you know, I just – I want to be able to – I want to see, like, all three of the, the main guys that are that are up for the center position, I want to see them get snaps at center and, and kind of see, you know, what the difference is and, and how do they look. Um because as you mentioned, you know, Davos said Ryan Linthicum would be the guy um, that would run out, run out there, but it was clearly very non-committal in how he said it. It, it, right. it wasn't like he's definitely the, he's definitely our guy. He separated himself. It's like, oh, I mean, it, it was kind of more of a uh, he's the one that's been in the room the longest. He's the most experienced, but you know, they're, they're, he hasn't separated himself um, as much as you know, as much to say that. Hey, we're, we're, he's definitely the guy uh, coming into the year. So, you know, I, I did find that interesting. Um, and then, you know, some of the depth behind him, I, I think, is, is going to be key. You know, how does Ian Reed, you know, come mm -hmm. in? You know, he's, he's been a guy that's, you know, he dealt with um, a lot last year and just wasn't able to, to get on the field for those reasons. So I kind of want to see him coming into his second year. Uh, You've yeah, heard his name. You've heard his name a couple times um, by, you know, Dabo and, and and some other people. So I think that's a that's a good one to watch, Ian Reed. Yeah. Ian Reed. Um, how, how does um, some of the true freshmen, how, how do they perform? Uh, Elijah Thurman is a guy we've heard a, a ton about. Um, uh, I think he's a guy that has definitely come in. He's one of those guys that I think Clemson really hit on. Um and I think he's going to be a, a big part of this this offensive line in the future. So it'd be cool to see kind of where he fits into the depth chart. Um, but how do some of the older guys look too that we just we don't know a ton about? I mean, he haven't seen a lot of. Dietrich Pennington is on the white team. Um, yeah, okay. He's a, he's a guy that they've just they've been waiting to really get him you know uh, to get him to fully commit to. Um, you know, being better and 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 being a, a part of this offense because you look at him and you're like, man, how is he like? How is he not playing? He's a grown man, massive human being. Um, he 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 would be a, a mauler uh, if he would just you know commit to his craft and, and all of that. 
Um, so kind of want to see how he looks when he gets in. Um, let's see who else. Uh, obviously, the first team guys, but we already mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think I think those are the main guys I, wa- I wanted to uh, look at. Oh, Zach Owens as well. Yeah. Uh, Flapjack. Yeah. Want to see kind of how he – because he's kind of had a similar uh, situation as, as Ian Reed. As far as um, well, not not a, a similar situation as far as circumstances, but both were were limited um, last year, and so I kind of want to see how he's you know transitioned and, and what he what does he look like um, in year two, and and kind of see how his progression is because he's massive too, and he had a lot of physical changes he had to he had to make. So how does he uh, how does he look out there? So those are some of the guys on the offensive line I kind of wanted to point out beyond the the starters and, and all that. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, it's a, it's a fun position group um, to watch because there is so much potential in that room and it's going to be exciting to see what this group looks like after the, you know, this limited time that, that Matt Luke has been able to coach these guys up and, you know, how different do they look? You know, Matt Luke has only been on campus uh, with the program for, a very short time since the bowl game. Um, so what does this group look like? Have they started to take those next steps? And and I think it'll be interesting to just kind of, you know, see what they look like because you go back to last spring game and how the offensive line looked. They looked bad. Uh, they gave up a ton of pressure. They gave up sacks. Um, they got absolutely brutalized by that defensive line. Um, so hopefully this year, you know, they're standing their ground a little bit. Obviously, the defense is going to get theirs at certain points in the game. You want to see the offensive line be able to 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 create some some good pockets for the quarterbacks and create good lanes in the in the running lanes as well. So uh, we'll see how all that shakes out. Um, finishing up with um, offense real quick so we can transition to defense. Let's talk about the two position groups that are probably the most solidified Um Outside of obviously uh, quarterback, uh, we all know who the starting quarterback is going to be, but uh, tight ends, obviously, and the running back position. Obviously, the running back position, you got Phil Moffa. You know what you have in Phil Moffa. Um, just look no further than that Notre Dame game that Phil Moffa put um, in the stat sheet and on the field was nothing short of amazing. So, obviously, we know what Phil Moffa is capable of when called upon and when he has to do it, right? Um, can't wait to see what his senior season looks like at, at Clemson. Uh, truly am excited about it, but you know, what, what does that depth look like behind him? You know, we talked about Jay Haynes earlier on in the show, pretty disappointing that he hasn't been able to be on the field for essentially the entire spring practice. But you talked about, uh, Keith Adams Jr. Right. And how, you know, every time a coach is interviewed, Keith Adams Jr. Just keeps getting mentioned. Like he's that guy there. I mean, he is, absolutely, um, you know, seems to have pulled away somewhat from the rest of the guys. But, you know, talking about some young guys, what is what is the David Ajama may look like? Right. Uh, you know, he's got some home run speed. So excited to see what he looks like. Um, so I think that's a big thing. And then obviously the tight ends, uh, you got burning stool. You know what you have in burning stool. Hopefully we can utilize him a little bit better this season. But athletically, you know what you have in burning stool. Um, but again, same thing with running back. What's the depth look like behind him? Dab- Dabo talked about, uh, you know, Osa Pat Henry and Marcus Dixon and how those dudes have started to take steps in the right direction. Um, and that's encouraging here. And obviously got a Josh Sapp as well. So it'll be interesting just to see where it shakes out after a Jake Brenningstool and a Phil Moffa for those two position groups. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and to your point, um, you know, you see – uh, you know, Olson, Pat Henry, and also Banks Pope as well. Uh, Marcus Dixon, yeah, you mentioned, yeah, I mean, developing that depth at, at tight end is, is going to be big. I, I expect, you know, if I would assume that Josh Sapp, Sapp is the next guy up right now. He's the one, he's the most experienced right now. And and he definitely got in um, and made some plays in the bowl game and, and at different, you know, in pockets at different points in the year. Um and I think he could be a really, really useful weapon uh, for them in, in, in spots. So we'll kind of see how he factors in. But, um, 
you know, Jake Brenning's still taking that next step and in, in, in being, you know, a true dynamic weapon for Clemson in the passing game, I, I think is going to be paramount because, I mean, he has all the talent in the world and we saw it at, at different points, but it, it just, it wasn't, wasn't consistent enough. And I don't think it was completely his fault. Uh, I mean, they, they, he certainly had a lot of opportunities that were missed uh, for one reason or another, uh, but you want, to see him be a, a more focal port, uh, focal point of the offense. And then obviously with running back, Phil Moffa, we know what he is, what he's capable of, you know, true RB1. But, you know, developing that depth behind him is going to be key. And I think Keith Adams is the guy – you mentioned Keith Adams. He's the guy that has – I think one of the things that that's helped him pull away is just being available. Um, you know, and he's just so steady. Um, and he's, he's tough to tackle. He just has a – I mean, he's a natural – at the position. And I think that's why they love him so much. I mean, he's not, you know, he's not the most athletically gifted running back in the world, but he, he um, I think he, I think just his, his, his well-roundedness and his ability um, to get tough yards, I think that's just valuable in, in any offense. And so that, that makes him uh, a really valuable. So I'm interested, uh, excited to see him. Um, and also, um, you know, David Ajuma may being the true freshman, obviously four star guy. Uh, you want to see him and, and kind of see him get some opportunities as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that that kind of does it for for my thoughts. Wish we could wish we could see Jay Haynes out there. I, yeah, it's unfortunate. We talked about it. I mean, I'd, I'd love to see Jay Haynes out there, but it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. Um, not meant to be. And and hopefully that allows some of those younger guys to to get in and and see, um, you know, see what they got, see if they can carve out a role. Um, but, you know, we'll see how it shakes out. Now let's go ahead and transition to the defensive side of the ball and, and talk about some position groups there. And obviously one of the first ones that come to mind for me is obviously the defensive end group. Um, you know, you know what you got in a guy, uh, TJ Parker, right? You, you know, absolute elite defensive end, uh, splashed onto the scene last season as a freshman and absolutely was a, a big piece of why that defense was so successful a year ago. Um, obviously the move for Peter from Peter Woods for, to go from defensive tackle to the defensive end position, obviously I think is one that's going to pay huge dividends. And when you think about a TJ Parker and a Peter Woods starting opposite each other on the defensive end, I mean, what more could you ask for, right? Unfortunately for us, we don't get to see Peter Woods in the spring game due to, you know, the illness that he has. That's unfortunate, but I think that could be a good thing because maybe we get to see, maybe we get to see some more of those younger guys along the defensive end position and see how they have progressed under Chris Rump in a very short amount of time. Right. But what do they look like? Right. What does that defensive end group look like outside of a TJ Parker and a Peter Woods? Because we know we're going to get in those two guys they're absolutely elite, but, you know, is Kay Denhoff, has he taken another step? He did play quite a bit um, towards, especially towards the end of last season. He started to look pretty good, specifically in that bowl game, had a pretty great uh, bowl game against Kentucky, right? So how does he look? Um, A.J. Hoffler, another guy that yep. you would hope starts to, to take that next step in his progression and really become a contributor for this team because honestly, we're going to need him. Um, is Zaire Patterson, is he ever going to become anything at Clemson? I think, you know, if not now, then probably it's, it's, never. Yeah. I mean, this, this uh, has got to be it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you're you're going to start getting passed by some of those, those young guys, right? Adam Kasai, uh, you know, uh, Jaheim Lawson, what is he going to look like? So, uh, you got Darian Mayo coming. You got Darian Mayo coming in the summer. Like there you go, you know, Darian Mayo coming in the summer. So you know, if not now, then when for a guy like Xavier Patterson? Um, you know, same extent, same thing could be said for a K. Denhoff. Although he his production has been you know significantly more than Zaire Patterson because his is just zero at this yeah. point. But how do you see that defensive end group shaping up? Um, and and who are you keeping your eye peeled for when it comes to the spring game? Yeah, I mean, you you hit on it. Um, we we know what we're gonna get out of T.J. Parker, just stud, future first round pick. I feel pretty comfortable saying that uh, when it's all said and done, uh, barring you know fingers crossed injuries and and all of that. 
Um, so just developing that depth behind him. And, you know, how does Caden's story look? Um, uh, th that's something I, I want. I mean, we don't get to see Peter Woods, but, you know, we get to see Caden's story. So is he going to, And you know, he's been dealing with stuff during the spring. So uh, um, I'm glad that he's healthy enough that we get a chance to see him. Um, so how does he look? You mentioned A.J. Hoffler, really liked him as a recruit. How does he look in year two? Um, and him taking that next step. Jaheim Lawson, you know, they, the, the guy that we we hear tons about hasn't, you know, gotten a chance on the field to really show it. But, you know, they say he's one of the best pass rushers on the team. Well, let's let's see it. Well, you know, you, you want it, especially since, you, you know, you're replacing, um, you know, some proven, you know, edge rushing, you know, talent. Um, you know, Xavier Thomas, you know, the, the sack numbers didn't. Uh, didn't really show it, but the pressures last year were, when he played were were huge. So you got to you got to replace that on one side. Um, so yeah, that's uh, we got to see kind of these guys start to develop because there's there's certainly talent in this room. Um, it's just we don't know a lot about a lot of these guys, um, and uh, developing that depth is is going to be key. Uh, Armand Mason is there too. I forgot about him. Mm -hmm. He's a guy yeah. that has definitely has gotten, you know, shout outs at different points, you know, really over the past couple of years. Um, so, you know, seeing him get an opportunity, uh, that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the room with a lot of, there's a lot of room for upward movement, you know, past the, the top guy. Um, so who kind of really takes hold of that spot and um, uh, well, that backup ish uh, spot, because obviously Peter Woods, um, there's a lot there's a lot of room to really you know work your way into the rotation so let, let's see who kind of steps up there yeah um yeah for sure and, and i think uh transition it just keep it with the defensive line and talk about defensive tackle quickly uh probably one of the deepest position groups on the team i think one of, one of the, the deepest most, rooms in the country in the country yeah. right yeah, yeah absolutely and i think one of the most interesting things about that group is like who's going to be able to carve out a role, right? Who's going to get, you know, the significant snaps in that group? Because I mean, we, it's a deep group, um, a very, very deep group. And I mean, you, you, it, you look at the rosters for the white and the orange. I mean, honestly, it, both defensive tackle positions are loaded for both of those teams. And it just speaks to, you know, the, the number of guys that we have in there and then the amount of talent that's in there as well. So, um, you know, you obviously you got a ton of experience there and a guy like Trey Williams, right? You got a DeMonte K part, you know, you got a ton of experience in there, and then you got some young guys that that you hope can come along as well. But um I'm gonna just be interested to see obviously who runs out there first and who takes the bulk of the snaps at that position because I think that'll that'll go a long way in, in seeing how these coaches feel about those defensive tackles and what that rotation may look like come fall. Right. Um, you know, especially since, you know, moving Peter Woods from defensive tackle. I mean, I think that that's a testament to kind of their not only their confidence in Peter Woods, but their confidence in the rest of the guys they have in that room. Absolutely. Um, they, they feel like they really hit on a lot of those guys. Um, so, you know, how do, how does you know, Trey Williams is a guy that he he's been in the program a long time. Peyton Page as well. Um, they're kind of the they're the seniors now and, and they're the ones that are, you know, kind of going to be looked toward for for leadership. So. How do they how do they look? Because um, Trey Williams in particular, you know, struggled with injuries last year, wasn't able to get on the field as much as we had hoped. Um, but I still think he's very much a factor for for getting a lot of playing time. Um, we already mentioned Vic Burley and kind of his his progression. And, and how does how does he look, you know, coming back from injury? How does Stephylin Green guy? I absolutely loved as a recruit. Like, one of my favorites in that it, 2023 class, regardless of position. Um, I'm really excited to see him. Uh, Champ Thompson, true freshman. Um, he's in there as well. I want to see how he looks. Um, you know, Caden Story is listed at defensive tackle, so I, I but I, I think we'll see him at multiple spots. I think they'll move him around a little bit. I think that you'll see him at, at D tackle sometimes and at end in others. Um, so kind of want to see how they look. Uh, let's see who else. Um, I already hit on Peyton Page. Like, yeah, those are the guys that really we're we're gonna um, the, the seniors are, are the guys that you know they're gonna be they're gonna be challenged because there's a lot of young talent here, and um, 
So, uh, but I think that competition is good, and it's a testament to how well uh, Clemson and, and Nick Eason has has recruited this position uh, the past couple of cycles. Um, the cupboard is certainly uh, full, and uh, yeah, it'll be exciting to see those guys get to work. Um, I mean, and, and honestly, step into their new roles. I don't, I don't know how I don't know how Nick Eason gets all these dudes to stay uh, at Clemson. <laughs> I don't either. It is a crowded room. I mean, um, his ability to to keep all those guys locked into one room is, 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 is a testament to him as a coach uh, and how much they like playing for him, obviously. Um, but let's go ahead and keep it going. Transition into the linebacker position. Obviously, you know the first two guys that are going to run out there, Barrett Carter, Wade Woodass, they're split on the two separate teams for the spring game. But you know what you, got, what you have in those two guys. Although Wade Woodass will be filling that Mike linebacker position that um, has obviously been voided. Um, so interested to see how comfortable he is there, how well he's playing there and, and kind of what, what he looks like. Um, and then obviously the name that's going to come to every single Clemson fan's mind is Sammy Brown, right? Five-star linebacker out of Georgia. Everybody's excited to see him. We've talked about him at several point in times this spring about how he's physically ready, but what is his mental you know, how, how is he mentally progressing as far as the playbook, as far as understanding his roles and responsibilities uh, and all of that stuff goes. So I think the spring game could go a long way to see, you know, what he looks like. Um, and then you think about guys, you know, behind him and, and you, you think about uh, Kobe McLeod, right? You think about um, D Creighton, you think about Jamal Anderson, uh, these these depth guys that are they're going to be very important to that room and and what do they look like how much have they progressed since last season right what steps have they taken forward um to become a bigger port a bigger part excuse me of this room and start to carve out a role for themselves i think it's going to be um really cool to see those guys because you know i have a sneaking suspicion that you know maybe some of these more solidified guys in these positions probably will not play uh, for very large portions of spring, right? You don't really need to see Barrett Carter be out there for the entire spring game. You know what Barrett Carter brings to the field, um, but you do need to see what D Creighton's going to look like, right? We do need to see what Jamal Anderson's going to look like, right? So uh, I think that's another very interesting group to see just kind of what the pecking order looks like at this point in time, uh, for this team. Absolutely, man. And I think even bigger and, and it's something that's, it, it's going to be a, a, a thing to watch. Um, this is, this is a big year for Wes Goodwin in a way, because, you know, we're two years removed now. He, I mean, he's, he's been defensive coordinator for two years. We're two years removed from the Brent Venables era. I mean, Barrett Carter is the only player, you know, on that roster left uh, of any, um, that, that's going to play at, at, at any point. That's that was a Brent Venables recruit. So this linebacker room is going is now going is fully basically wet. Wes is now, and so I, I want to see kind of you know what his identity and what his um, philosophy as a linebacker coach and how he develops uh, the guys that he brought in. Um, I, I think that's um, I think that's going to be something that's that we're going to be watching this year because again this is a a group we we have two guys we 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 feel pretty confident in we we know a lot about Barrett Carter Wade Woodass and then a lot of a lot of names a lot of names lot of, but not a lot of not names a lot, yeah not a lot of production and and not a lot of uh you know film so um I, I kind of want to see how you know that linebacker group is it starts to take shape because you know this is this is his fully his baby now and uh, pretty much and and when Barrett Carter is gone after this year you know, there's nothing left from the Brent Venables era. Um, and, and, and so I, I want to see kind of how he looks and, and, and kind of, well, how that group looks and how they've, they've made steps, you know, with the departure of um, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Um, and, and kind of because that's a massive, massive piece to replace. You don't just replace that. Uh, just his experience and his, his natural affinity for the position. It's hard, hard to teach. Um, so how do the guys behind him look? So that that's, this linebacker group is, is really interesting. The makeup of it. Um, yeah. it's one of the more intriguing aspects of this team this year. 
Yeah, it's 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 going to be it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, and you make a lot of good points about how this is, you know, mostly outside of Barrett Carter, a you know, West Goodwin linebacker room. And and what does that look like? Um, we, we'll see. Uh, there's you mentioned there's a lot of good names behind those those top two guys, but you know, what do they look like? You know, when the when the ball snapped and and you know we're we're between you know, those white lines, what, what, what's it going to look like? And I think, uh, I think we have a ton of talent there and, um, you know, I, I think we're going to be okay in that position, uh, for, for many, many years to come, hopefully. Uh, but transitioning to, um, the cornerback position for the defense, we're to the back end of the defense now and, and talking about some, um, uh, a position group where we lost, um, you know, quite a bit, off of off of last last year's team, right? Um, you, you talk about a Nate Wiggins, right? You, the the guy was an absolute, I mean, just baller his entire time at Clemson. You know, obviously, you know his struggles early on were well documented uh, on national television. Uh, but I tell you what, that guy uh, just has no quit in him, man, because that did not affect him. Not one bit. If anything, it made him more determined to become a lockdown corner, which is exactly what he did. So um, shout out to him. Hope he has a long career in the NFL. But it's time to turn the page for the Clemson Tigers. And, you know, what do we have at, at cornerback? Uh, and obviously in the bowl game last last year uh, to finish the season, we had to start a couple really, really young guys uh, in that in that bowl matchup and. You know, they played pretty well. Shelton Lewis, Avian Terrell, they played really well in that bowl game. Um, you know, have they took taken another step forward, right? It's awesome that they came in um, and just kind of got thrown into the fire, and I think that'll do, you know, pay well for dividends for them going down the road and and their progression and their development as players. But, you know, what, what do they look like? And then, obviously, behind them, you've heard Dabo mention a Taboy Fegan a lot been here since the bowl prep and he says that he's he started progressing a lot and and you know he looked he looks really good out there so you know what you know how 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 well does he look right um you know how comfortable does he look out there in coverage against some of these guys that he'll obviously be covering some of the better wide receivers at least on the Clemson roster when it when you look at that that uh that orange roster and and the wide receivers they have over there think that'll be interesting to see for um, the uh, the spring game. But what are your thoughts on the cornerback position um, and, and how this is not only obviously in the spring game, but how it'll shake out overall heading into the fall? Yeah, um, it's a it's a group with a lot of talent, a lot of room for, um, you know, upward mobility, kind of like how, how I mentioned with, with the defensive room, defensive end room. But it's. You know, we have we've seen a, a limited sample size um, from, you know, a lot of these guys. Uh, you know, Avion Terrell and Shelton Lewis were the only ones that um, have played. And like uh, we saw them play extended minutes. Um, you know, Jaden Lucas is a guy that's still dealing with the injuries, and you want to see him come back and really, you know, take that next step. You know, he's, he'll be a junior this year, um, and he was a former you know, borderline five-star recruit coming out of high school. Um, and so he just, he needs to be able to get right. So, but this group in general, it's, it's a lot about, it's not so much about the starters, but it's, it's really about the depth and, and who kind of, um, you know, sets themselves apart. Um, you know, you still have guys like, you know, Brandon Strozier, who's coming back from injury. He'll play in this game. Uh, Miles Oliver, a guy we rarely ever mentioned, but he's in there uh, hanging around. Uh, some of the the true you mentioned Tayboy uh, Fegan and uh, true freshman Corian Gibson obviously is not going to be able to play, uh, but he's working his way back. Really, really talented uh, player. Um, there's just there's just a lot of youth, um, and so you're you're kind of wanting to see kind of how you know this group starts to progress, um, and uh, you know who is who kind of you know uh, I think we 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 know. You know who who our top two guys are, um, but you want to see you want to be able to ro rotate more and more guys in and out, and um, and you know you can't just hope that uh, Terrell and Lewis are, are going to carry you throughout the season. You need to be able to to build that depth because 
you don't have Nate Wiggins anymore. You know, Sheridan Jones played a lot of football, had played a ton of snaps, had it was a lot of experience and in, in, in leadership in that room. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you don't easily replace that. And so you got to kind of figure out, um, uh, you kind of figure out who's going to take that next step and who's going to, you know, step into that, uh, you know, and, and build that depth more. So uh, it'll be something to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely a position group with some question marks um, and who's going to step up and be that debt for that position. But transitioning to the last position group we'll talk about on the defensive side of the ball, uh, and that is safety. And this is a a pretty deep position group for the Tigers. There's a ton of experience in this room. You think about a guy in Tyler Venables um, that obviously didn't play for all of last season, but just the experience uh, and the leadership. That, that you have in that room when a guy like that comes back and and he's a part of the fold, right? And then obviously you know what you got in a guy in Khalil Barnes, a guy that splashed onto the scene last year as a freshman, um, absolutely killed it. Um, you know what you got in him. You think about R.J. Mickens, a guy that we we got we got to come back for his final season as a Clemson Tiger. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge, could not be understated or could not be overstated how important that is that we got R.J. Mickens back in the safety room for this upcoming season. It's going to pay huge dividends for this group. Um, but there, there's a ton of – I mean, you could list guy after guy. Sherrod Koval, who has played some quality snaps for this team, obviously spent a little time injured. Uh, Kylan Griffin, um, you, incoming freshman, uh, Ricardo Jones, he obviously won't be playing. But, you know, there's a ton of names in this group. I, I know a Dixon. He's a guy that's been mentioned a ton. Um, a Joe Wilkinson, another very young guy, freshman coming in, guy that's been mentioned quite a few times in this uh, in spring practice as a guy that's just coming in and producing and just finding his way around the ball and and making plays. And I mean, this is a this is a super deep group. Feel really comfortable about this group. Uh, you know, heading into the spring game and then obviously heading into fall as well, but. Uh, go ahead and give us uh, your your rundown and your thoughts on this this safety group heading into the 2024 season. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's in a really good place, um, especially from a talent perspective. And, um, you know, it, it, there, there's some guys with some star talent next and, and some star power next to their name. But there are a lot of guys that I think were just really flat out good at evaluations. I think Mickey Khan is a guy that doesn't get a lot of credit from the, the Clemson fan base. Um, um uh, you know, he has, you know, the past connections to Dabo and, and, and all of that. And, you know, that's kind of been a, a, a knocking point against him over the years. But his top, uh, I, I think he's done a phenomenal job with this room. And I, I think they're in a really good shape. Um, and they just continue to play really well. I mean, these past few seasons, uh, the safety, like Clemson has just had really, really good safety play. Um, and, you know, you've got to replace a guy in, in, in Jalen Phillips, you know, who, was a very, very productive player. Uh, you know, one of the leading tacklers, uh, about as reliable as they come from a, from a safety. And so you, you gotta, you gotta replace him, but you, you feel really good about what you saw from some of the young guys. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, you mentioned Khalil Barnes, obviously he's a guy with a lot of positional versatility. Uh, I feel like you can play him anywhere and, and be okay. Obviously he's, he spent a lot of last year playing nickel, um, I think you'll see that's where you'll see him mostly. But I, I think if in a pinch, I feel like he could play anywhere. Um, Kylan Griffin really was was pressed into action uh, in the second half of last year, and I thought he he played really really well. Um, I just I feel really good, I, and I think guys like you know Sherrod Koval, a guy that's been forget kind of fallen by the wayside because of the injuries. He's a guy I, I still have a ton of um, you know high praise for, and, and a lot of. Um, high hopes for because I think athletically he's he's extremely gifted, um, you know he's a hard hitter and, and all that. So I, I want to see him fully healthy uh, back out there and getting it out there. Um, and you mentioned Tyler Venables uh, having his experience is a big deal. Uh, I know you know some fans will you know roll their eyes and be like, oh man, another Venables, and, and you know it's time to get you know, yeah. <laughs> you know it, 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 it's time to kind of. You know, get some of these young guys. But, you know, having his experience is a big deal. Um, and so having him healthy um, is, is a big is a big deal. And getting him along with R.J. Mickens provides some some needed leadership in this group. Um, 
so I mean, I, I feel good about this um, this room and, and kind of where it is right now. Um, you already mentioned uh, you also you also mentioned true freshman Noah Dixon. I uh, like really liked him and and as a recruit and Ricardo Jones. Hopefully, obviously won't we won't get to be able to see him on Saturday, but uh, I'm really high on him as well. I, I, I again, I just think the makeup of this room. There's a lot of um, it's a versatile group. There's a lot of different body types and skill sets, um, and uh, there are guys with a lot of positional versatility. I think Tayboy Fegan could play safety if you wanted him to. Yeah, uh, and so uh, and then you got a guy in Ashton Hampton coming in, um, you know, in the summer. Um, so who, I mean, this is going to be a really, uh, just the defensive back room in general. There's just a lot of guys with a lot of different skill sets um, and, and they're really talented football players as well. So I think they've done a good job with this group, feel, um, feel comfortable about where the safety room is right now, especially getting RJ Mickens back, um, that you're going to get some really quality play out of them this year. And uh, spring game will be a good chance to see a, a lot of these young guys um, get out there and make plays. Yeah, absolutely, man. And and it's 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 going to be a fun game to watch. I, I can't wait to watch it. Let's finish up with some special teams um, and and the kicking, obviously, competition that is currently ongoing for the Clemson Tigers. Everybody knows uh, our kicking woes last season were well documented. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, it had far too much effect on a lot of Clemson games um, and how they played in certain situations. Obviously, you know, Robert Gunn did not have the season that we all expected him to have. He didn't have the season that I'm sure he expected himself to have. We had to, you know, call our boy from sitting on the couch in, in Charleston to, to come somewhat stabilize the, the kicking room. Um, and everybody knows how that worked out. Although, you know, it was okay at times. It was not good for majority of the time. But obviously, went out with a bang though. That ball yeah, went, hey, went out, went out <laughs> with a bang, man. Hey, killed it. Absolutely killed it. Uh, shout out to him. In the South Appreciate Carolina it. game. Yeah, yeah, you know, everything that huge kicks in the South Carolina game. Um, but you got Nolan Hauser in now, or Huser, um, Robert Gunn are obviously battling it out. They're split into two separate teams for the special teams. Um, when Dabble was asked about it, he said that Robert Gunn was a little more consistent to this point, but he didn't, you know, that wasn't like a said with a whole bunch of confidence. Yeah. So unfortunately it looks like our kicking game is still in somewhat of a flux and there's still seem to be some uncertainty when it comes to the kicking game. What are your thoughts on um, on that and kind of Dabo's response to the questions about the kicking game when he was asked about it yesterday in his interview? Yeah, I mean, you can take it one of two ways. You can you can say that, um, you know, the way he phrased it and, you know, the, the fact that there hasn't been a um, – you know, a, a true separator and in, in that, you know, Robert Gunn is maybe has a slight leg up, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. You could say, well, oh, maybe they're just both kicking really well. And, uh, but, you know, you would think if they were Davo would, would say that, <laughs> but again, yeah, you don't know, but you could also, you could take it that way, or you could take it as neither of them are very consistent. And we're still going to have questions uh, heading into the fall about, about this, um, this kicking situation. You know, there's not really much to say. I, I mean, you, you just they you got to hope they get right. Um, you you hope they are right, and if they're not, that they get right. Because yeah, I can't did, afford, you, cannot look, afford to to have the situation you did last year. Because there is no uh, there is no grad assistant kicker to call up this go around. Yeah, I don't I don't I think we're fresh out of grad assistant kickers to to call up off the couch. And at this point, one of them have to work out, right? Robert Gunn as a kicker last last year came in as a freshman. Obviously, highly recruited guy, right? Same thing with Nolan Huser, highly recruited guy. One of these guys have to figure it out and become, you know, and pull ahead and start becoming that that consistent kicker that we need because it, it affected the way that Clemson had to play games um, and bit us far too many times last season. So we really need that. Um, as far as the punting game, obviously, we know we have Aiden Swanson. He had an absolute uh, amazing season last year. Uh, yep, and didn't get enough attention because 
we yeah. were punting too much. Yeah, and... we were, <laughs> yeah, maybe he had a little too many reps last season, but yeah. he did an amazing job for Clemson and flipped the field on several occasions and put our defense in an advantageous position on more than one occasion. So shout out to him. Uh, Jack Smith is obviously going to be his backup this season. Hopefully he starts taking that next step forward. We'll get to see what he looks like in the spring game. Uh, but that'll be important because obviously we lose Aiden Swanson after this season as our as our punter. So uh, we're going to need to fill that void next offseason, and hopefully Jack Smith is that guy to uh, to fill that void for us. But, um, yeah, that kind of wraps up the spring game. Any other thoughts on the spring game or, or um, any other thing you want to cover on, on what you're looking for as far as um, – you know, just storylines or, or anything heading into spring game? Um, Not really. Uh, I think, I mean, this was a, I mean, we went position by position, so was, this was pretty comprehensive. Um, we, we mentioned kind of, uh, you know, Kyle Richardson uh, being the offensive coordinator for the spring, uh, for the white team. Um, that'll be fun to see, you know, he was an air raid guy. Um, and, and he talked about it when Garrett Riley was hired. So, Kind of want to see kind of what his take on the, and how he calls plays, and because um, you know you would think you know he's potentially a, a, an option or heir apparent should Garrett Riley uh, choose to uh, move on at, at some point. Um, so you know we'll we'll kind of see that'll be a good opportunity, and and then Mickey Kahn being the defensive coordinator, you get to see. I mean, we haven't really ever seen him call plays. It's really, I mean, he's the co-defensive coordinator, but we've never seen him. You know be involved in, in, in calling plays. Right. Um, so, well, hey, might as well kind of see how, how, he, how that goes. Um, but yeah, um, beyond that, I think we, we, we touched on it on everything, quarterbacks, offensive line, explosive plays, defense, you know, we're building depth defensively, young guys, I think we, we hit on a lot of the storylines, so I'm feeling pretty good. Um, you want to? I know. Yeah, I know you uh, mentioned potential. You know, given like a score prediction, and oh, and Jay in the comment section also mentions that score predictions. Um, so uh, let's uh, yeah. let's go ahead and do that. All right. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, go with um, a score prediction. Uh I didn't really have a score prediction in mind, but I'll come up with one here quickly. I, I don't either. Uh, it just uh, just came up to me. Let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the orange team to win. Um, selfishly, because I want to see this offense take the next step. I want them to switch into a new gear that we haven't seen for the past three seasons. So I'm gonna hope that they show flashes of explosiveness uh, and they get some big plays going. So. I'll go orange team to win it, uh, and I'll go 24-17. Okay. I can get down with that. Um, I'm, I'm with you, and I'm with you on the orange team winning. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more – I'm going to be more optimistic slightly on, on the, the point total. I'm going to go 28 28- – 21 orange team. Okay. Um, I just, I, I want to see the, the big plays um, and the consistent, you know, the, the offense looking, you know, easy for Cade and in, in year, uh, year three, um, year two in the system. Um, yeah. And then Chris Rosina also being in year, technically being in year two in the system and year two in general. Um, so I kind of want to see them, uh, like I said, I want to come away from this game thinking, oh, the, the defense still needs some work. And, you know, there's some guys that, you know, there's some position groups that, okay, they, you know, they got a little exposed a little bit because we got some youth there. Yeah. Uh, that would be nice because a lot of the experience really is on the offensive side of the ball when you look at it, especially for yes. the orange team. Uh, guys that have been, or a lot of these um, guys are in the, going into their third, fourth years in the program. So kind of want to see some, some separation there um, and some, um, some playmaking from the offense uh, for the 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 orange team offense, especially. So, yeah, yeah. Here's Absolutely. to hoping a, a higher scoring spring game. I mean, I think both of these would be high the highest scoring spring games we've had in a while. Yeah, uh, they, they, from, from both teams. So, yeah, for sure. We we there has not been a ton of offense 
uh, in the Clemson spring game for quite some time. So uh, Isaac Smith gets in and says 24-14 um, for the orange team. Dylan gets in and says 27-12. Tiggs gets in and says white team 21, orange team 17. Yeah, he's going with the high white team with the upset. Going for the white team. All right. Uh, I hope you're wrong. I hope our uh, our majority first team offense uh, puts up more points than that. But uh, we shall see. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun game to watch, man. I can't wait. Um, I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to watch it live. It'll depend on you know how many games we're in for the the travel ball tournament and all that stuff. That and, and it's I'll also on ACC Network. Do you have um, do you have ESPN Plus or or uh... I do. I do. Okay. Yeah. So you'll yeah. be able to. Yeah, I'll be able to watch it. How how ridiculous! Like, let's just let's just talk about that for a second yeah. before we we move on to around college football and and our last segment and then turn it over to the comment section. How ridiculous is it that we have a Clemson spring game and it's not going to be televised? It's 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 been thrown to the AC, ACC network. Okay, let's just it is what it is, right? We can't even get on the ACC network. We're, we're relegated to uh, streaming the, service. The extra ch- the ACC the, network the extra. extra that you have, yeah. you have to log on to your, to your ESPN app and hope your cable provider has the you know, <laughs> ACC like YouTube TV. Like I can log, I can put it in and and it's fine. Right. But not everybody you know has um, has that package, and so Absolutely. it's like you know it used to be you would turn on you know it used to be you could turn on ACC network and they would be televising it. Uh, this this spring and, and in the glory days, you know they would you know Clemson was on ESPN on ESPN yeah with yeah. Dab Dabo walking around the field basically doing ESPN's job for them for you know two and a half hours uh, for the spring game so yeah um, but unfortunately but uh, just what, another what, another example of the ACC failing to promote their biggest brands yeah I, I mean I, it's, it's it's absolute I mean it's just I, I look, man. The, the ACC is is a dead conference. Um, I can't wait for Clemson to get out of the ACC. I can't wait for us to be done with this this ridiculous conference that clearly cannot, um, you know, look out for its member institutions. They 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 just it's it's literally misstep after misstep. Uh, and this is just the latest one in a in a long list of them that we could talk about, you know, on another show forever. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's frustrating when, you know, Clemson is one of the first big major college football teams to play a spring game, and you got to watch it on a string, streaming service instead of on national television. Um, I just think it's a missed opportunity for not only ACC but ESPN. Um, but, again, obviously those people don't care. They've they've made their decisions and you know it is what it is. Indeed, indeed. Uh, but you know, no point in crying over it now. That's oh, right. Yeah, it'll gotta, it won't enjoy. change what happens on the field for the spring game. Uh, so I will happily watch it anyway. Um, and you know, hopefully our our Clemson Tigers look really good in the spring game, and we can come away feeling somewhat encouraged heading into. Um, the summer months, and then obviously uh, in the next fall. So we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, let's go ahead and transition to our last topic of the night before we turn it over to the comment section, Jordan. Uh, and let's talk about all around um, college football. Uh, around college football is a new segment that we we started a, a couple weeks back uh, where we just kind of highlight some different stories. Could be Clemson related, could be national related uh but just some quick thoughts uh, by us. First and foremost, I want to give a shout out to a couple Clemson greats, Jordan. Um, I saw a video clip uh, earlier today um, where Dabo had Sammy Watkins call in to a Clemson meeting uh, to tell Taj Boyd that he was going to be inducted into the Clemson Hall of Fame later this fall. Um, And then the script got flipped on on Sammy Watkins, yeah. where Dabo told him 
you can't be a Hall of Fame quarterback at Clemson without a Hall of Fame receiver and then told Sammy Watkins that he will also be inducted into the Clemson Hall of Fame later this fall. So that was a super cool video. If you guys haven't seen it, I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, every Clemson fan who's been a Clemson fan for any length of time know exactly what those two individuals specifically Absolutely. mean to it, not only Dabo Sweeney, but this Clemson program as a whole. I mean, these guys were the guys laying the foundation for what eventually became a two-time national championship winning program, um, you know, under Dabo Sweeney. So those were the guys that were laying the foundation. Those were the guys that, you know, committed to Clemson when it wasn't, you know, the thing to do before they were, you know, back to being a national power, you know, before they were even thought of in, in the, uh, in, in national relevance as far as a national title. So shout out to both of those guys. Can't wait to see, um, you know, the production that's put on when those two dudes are uh, kind of enshrined in the Clemson hall of fame. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw where uh, Dabo mentioned in his press conference that potentially Sammy uh, uh, will be one of the, um, you know, special guest coaches uh, during the spring game, still kind of working out, you know, his schedule. So he may or may not be there on, on Saturday. We'll see. Uh, but he also mentioned DJ Reader is coming back. Um, so wanted to wanted to throw that out, out there as well as far as like the, the guys that were coming back. Um, but no, but, but Taj Boyd, Sammy Watkins, two of the most just – exciting players and, and and two of the more most influential players to ever put on a Clemson uniform and just kind of what they what they meant for this program when you know in the early infancy stages of of what Clemson eventually became in the playoff era it was I mean it, it can't be overstated um and I'm just I'm really happy for those two um Sammy is one of my especially one of my favorite you know players period of, in Clemson history just um he was the what well, he was the first player to um I know he was the he was the first like freshman he was, or maybe he was the first or the second true freshman to be a, a consensus all-american or you might have been unanimous all-american um uh, you know just dynamic dynamic receiver made a ton of plays over his three-year career um and then and Taj Boyd, obviously, just you can't overstate. I mean, he's still Clemson's all-time leader in passing uh, passing yards and passing touchdowns. Yep. Um, the numbers he put up were just were stupid. Like just going back and looking at him, um, you know, well, you know, close to I think he had eleven thousand yards, uh, over a hundred touchdowns. Um, just just special special stuff. He was the he was the ACC's all-time leading passer until Kenny Pickett did it in like seven seven eight years. Um, so Taj Boy and yeah. Sam Hartman. Um, so that they will always, they will always be my uh, Taj Boyd will always be the, the the leader in my my heart because he did it in far less games than 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 those others two did. Yeah, I mean, Todd, look, he had over thirteen thousand yards, one hundred thirty three touchdowns. Yeah, he had thirteen thousand. I, mean, I, I lowballed him. My fault. <laughs> thirteen thirteen thousand yards, one hundred thirty three touchdowns. Uh, two team, two time all you know, first team, all ACC. I mean, like he, he's, he's the one that laid the groundwork for, you know, I saw somebody mention it uh, in the comment section. I forgot who it was. I lost the comment now, but he, he's the guy that laid the groundwork for Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence to come to Clemson. That that's the dude that that's the dude that kicked it off for us. So, you know, any Clemson fan who's, who knows would, you know, we're, we will forever be indebted to a guy like Taj Boyd. And then, Sammy Watkins as well. I mean, those were like, you know, Sammy Watkins and and the 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 rest of those wide receivers. Those were the guys that started coming in that kind of paved the way and and started when Clemson was, you know, wide receiver U and we were just producing all these big time wide receivers, right? So, um, you know, it, I don't think those two guys specifically those two guys. There were a lot more guys, but you know, just talking about the two guys that are being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Their, their their imprint on this program can't be understated. Like it's it's huge what those guys did for you know Dabo Sweeney and and just the the program that Clemson is today. Um, it's it's crazy. It's crazy to think that uh, Sammy Watkins 
and uh, you know, Taj Boyd and and um, um, I'm blanking on his name right now. Who are you thinking? Marta- of? Martavis Bryant. Martavis Bryant. New uh, Hopkins. New Hopkins. Like all these dudes were on the same team together. Adam Humphreys. Adam yeah, Humphreys. I mean, like, yeah, that. <laughs> I mean, man, uh, Dwayne Allen. Dwayne uh, Allen. Uh, yeah. Brandon, I mean, Brandon, Brandon Ford. Like that. Yeah. Those, those teams were absolutely. Yeah. Those teams were absolutely sick. Andre Ellington yeah. at running back. It, it, yeah. It just, man, those were, those were some special, special. It's crazy, teams, man. Teams, man. It's crazy. When you, when you look when you look back and just just think about it and and you know it's 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 amazing that that you know we were able to get all those guys committed to Clemson um, you know at the same time and and get them on the field together and obviously it turned into something pretty special for Clemson and glad that those dudes are getting recognized um, for their contributions to Clemson and couldn't couldn't be two better guys getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. But uh, transitioning, uh, let's let's talk about um, last thing we'll talk about before we get off of here, or before we transition to the comment section is um, the Florida State and Clemson lawsuits. Obviously, there's been some movement. There's tons of rumors out here on YouTube. Uh, you know, there's people that are saying that you know ESPN has already declined the um, extension for. Uh, the ACC and and all this stuff and and but there there was some movement in the case between Florida State and uh, the ACC in the state of North Carolina. So Jordan, go ahead and get um, myself and the rest of the comment section uh, up to speed on exactly what happened and what it means for both Clemson and FSU because any ruling in any case affects not only you know the ACC as a whole, but definitely Clemson and FSU because we're the two universities right now that have active lawsuits against the ACC. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts right now, but um, essentially what happened today was um, – so, well, to, to set the stage, Flor- you know, we, we know about Florida State's lawsuit um, against the ACC, but, you know, what, you know, what the hearing was about today was – the ACC's countersuit in North Carolina and about whether or not it would be uh, it would proceed or or whether Florida State's motion to dismiss it uh, would we carry through and the courts ruled in favor of the ACC that the at the hearing and the 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 case should and will be heard in in North Carolina at least the countersuit um, and uh, so you know this is a big deal for the ACC because they get to try you know to hold this case in their home territory. And with Florida State, they still have their their suit pending in Florida. But the fact that the ACC was able to, to sue first, um, you know, is not a good sign for Florida State because Florida State law usually uh, necessitates that the case that was filed first takes precedent. Um, and so we'll kind of we'll see how it goes. It's it's a it's a win for the ACC, but it's it's also a step towards what I, me personally, what I think all of this is coming down to, um, and that is that this is going to eventually be settled um, for into some negotiation because Florida State does have the opportunity to appeal um, to a higher court. Um, and will the ACC be willing to let this get all the way up to the Supreme Court? I, I doubt it. Um, I I think it's, a, it's more of a – we're kind of getting through all the, the ugly stuff before we, we finally just say these um, two particular parties sit down and be like, all right, this is not going to end well for either one of us. Let's, let's work it. Let's, let's sit down, settle on a number and, and we'll get on uh, and we'll move on. So all of that has to go through. Um, and so, it, and it does mean a lot for, for Clemson's case um, because Obviously, that makes you think that, OK, well, the, the case might still Clemson was able to file first, but that still might mean that uh, the ACC will be able to have their case heard, their countersuit heard in North Carolina as well. Um, so we're going to see how that kind of um, th- that kind of plays out. But it's a it's a big, you know, sort of preliminary um, action and 
and sort of moment for this whole saga uh, that's taking place. Um, so I kind of wanted to I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I'm not a lawyer, uh, so there's a lot of stuff that still doesn't um, <laughs> that I still don't completely understand. Uh, but Florida State did have one one win in their favor, and it was that the uh, the ACC had um, that, that well Florida State had they dismissed the ACC's notion that Florida State had violated their fiduciary duties um, by by um, you know, by suing. Um, and so that does mean that Florida State's case is still, you know, is still valid. And so that's a that's a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot of other implications that I am not I don't have the law, the, the credentials to really explain. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was worth mentioning because obviously Florida State's case is, you know, while they're they're separate cases from Clemson's, they are tied together. Uh, because of what the end goal is, and they're you know both schools are obviously uh, working towards a, a way to to eventually exit. Um, so uh, all anything that happens in the Florida State case is of uh, very particular interest for Clemson. So we'll kind of see um, how this continues to play out. Yeah, I mean obviously there's there's a ton more legal battles to come and posturing by you know, this lawyer team and that lawyer team and the ACC and Clemson and FSU, they'll both posture or all three of them posture back and forth. And, you know, what all the technicalities of the law is, I'm not going to talk about because I have no idea. Um, I think one thing that goes in Clemson's favor is obviously they were able to file first because the law in the state of South Carolina doesn't say that you have to notify the person that you are following the lawsuit against. So obviously their case in the state of South Carolina got put in prior to the ACC um, putting their case in, in the state of North Carolina. So we'll see how that all plays out. But I agree with you, Jordan, eventually, like this is a whole bunch of stuff we have to get through to ultimately end up with all three of these parties are going to sit down at some point in time, whether it be together or separate and figure out a dollar amount that it's going to take for both of these universities to leave the ACC. Ultimately, I think that's where it ends up. Regardless of all this stuff happening in the courts, I still think we end up with, you know, all parties involved, you know, settling on a dollar amount. Who knows what that'll be? Um, and the schools will pay it and they'll be free to go out of the ACC. And what is left of the conference will, you know, I don't know. Um circle the ships and, and try to save the conference. I don't I don't know what happens to the ACC. I guess it depends on if other universities follow suit behind Clemson and Florida State. You know, it's possible that maybe the ACC could survive if it's just Clemson and Florida State that leave. That leave. You know, obviously they'd be a lesser conference, but they're, they're, they're a lesser conference right now with Florida State and Clemson today. Um, at least that's how it's been operated for, you know, many years. So, Again, we'll we'll see how it all shakes out. It's 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 going to be interesting um, when all this stuff gets figured out. Who knows? Uh, I think the deadline. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, but the deadline for Clemson to leave the conference for what would it be? The 2025 season. They would have to submit the paperwork by August 15th. Is that correct? Uh, I don't really know those. I don't. Dates. I don't want to answer that question because I don't have. I don't have that all right. Yeah, off I, 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 I think know. the August fifteenth date is there, correct. I, I know the August fifteenth date is related to that, but I'm trying to. Remember. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't know the specifics of it, but obviously there's there's certain deadlines that have to be met. So um, again, scour the internet, figure that stuff out. When all this stuff works out, uh, who knows? Um, it's very possible that Clemson and Florida state will be in the conference for next season, uh, possibly the season after who, who knows how this stuff, uh, gets worked out, but you know, for Clemson and Florida state, obviously the sooner, the better, but again, there's a lot of stuff that happens, has to happen between, uh, now and, and that decision ultimately being made. Absolutely. The one thing we do know for sure is both of these schools will be out of the ACC at some point in time. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's, 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 there's, there's no, this, this isn't going to work itself out where, you know, Clemson and FSU decide to stay, you know, what the specifics of it look like, um, who knows? But the one thing we do know is these two teams will not be a part of the ACC for the long term future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, going to be one this is something we'll we'll continue to monitor. But you know, obviously, we want to talk more. You know, we, we're going to dedicate most of the. Right, we spent a show talking about when Clemson sued the ACC. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't want to spend. You know, uh, obviously, our focus is ultimately is, is on this season, uh, but it That's is right. something that we'll we'll continue to to give updates on and and give our thoughts on when when uh, you know new information arises. So we'll kind of see how uh, that continues to play out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, let's uh, that that'll kind of wrap it up for. The plan portion of the show tonight, guys, go ahead and get into the comment section. We'll give you uh, a short amount of time to uh, get your questions and comments in. Me and Jordan respond, and then we'll get out of here. It's been almost two hours already we've been on here, Jordan. It's a longer show, but we obviously wanted to uh, go in somewhat depth about uh, the roster and, and what we saw heading into the spring game, just to kind of preview it for everybody and for everybody to know where we stand and get our thoughts on it. So, uh, Let's uh, kick it to the comment section. Yeah, um, I only have a I only have enough time to answer a, a couple questions. Um, yeah, let's just do like two questions and then pop up out of here. Uh, let's see. Let me give y'all guys some time, but. Um, SEC dog asked a question about about Clemson and Florida State leaving the ACC. He says, he says how, uh, now that they're going to 12 teams, why would Clemson or FSU want to leave the easiest road to the playoffs? ACC's best team lost by 60 points to the second best SEC team. Yes, they played the game. Um, well, to answer your first question, um, it's not about getting to the playoff. I, I think – I think that's that's one of the short sighted things about oh man I mean Clemson and Florida State they you know they have it so good the AC, half the ACC doesn't care about football they can just you know with with the twelve team, with the expansion like they'll get in every year um, but I, I think the the thing is is the goal isn't to get to the playoffs it's to win it's to compete in the when you get there and I think with the growing revenue gap and and, and all the things that we've we've talked about ad nauseum about the the separation of, of the sec and the big 10 from the rest of the sport you're, uh, there's going to be a certain point where clemson and florida state aren't going to be able to compete compete financially um with those teams and so yeah it'll be great that they get you know they'll have access to the playoffs and they'll get there but they're going to be playing teams that have significantly more um you know dollar uh capital to work with when it comes to facilities, when it comes to recruiting, when it when it comes to eventually when these players start getting paid, that's going to be a, a, a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there there are a lot of things to consider about kind of from a financial standpoint where the deficit that Clemson for, and Florida State will be operating at because they're already operating at a deficit now and they've managed to be competitive despite that. But it's mm -hmm. getting it'll get to the point. Um, within the next five or six years where that gap is is going to be unsustainable uh, for Clemson and Florida State as far as remaining competitive at the top of the sport. Like, yeah, they'll be, you know, they'll outspend the rest of their conference and, in, 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 you know, for the most part, beat up on, on all the teams that don't, don't really care. But what's going to happen when they get to the playoffs? I mean, you know, I, I just – I don't see how they're going to consistently be, you know, playoff and title contenders uh, in the future – with the way that the revenue sharing um, is currently set up and the way it's going to be set up in, in the near future. So that's, that's kind of more of the, that, that's more of the, the plight of Clemson and Florida state. It's because at the end of the day, these, whether you, you think Clemson and Florida state are, 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 you know, truly ready to compete in the sec or not, like they believe that they are not just the sec, but big 10, wherever they end up, they, these two programs believe that they should be competing at the top of the sport. They spin mm -hmm. like it. They operate like it. 
et cetera. And they, and, and not only do they operate like it, like it, you know, that's how the, the national, uh, their national brands speak to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's, it's also a protection of the brand itself because you're sitting in a, de, uh, uh, a conference that's essentially depreciating in value and therefore you are depreciating in value. Yeah. And that's just, if you're Clemson and Florida state, you can't afford to do that. Like, yeah, you, look, you, you've more or less cared, you know, these two programs have been the backbone of this conference for the better part of 30 years. Yeah. So and I, you have to, at a certain point, it's like, okay, well, this conference hasn't done anything. It has, has not done any enough to, to support us and to promote us and put our best interests at heart. And now we're, we're stuck in this situation. And now we're in this situation where we're not going to be able to compete the way we feel like we should be in the near future. So whether you agree with that, that mindset or not, that's how they feel. And that's why they want to leave. It's not about, uh, we, we want to, we want the easiest road to the playoff because at the end of the day, it's not going to help them win when they get there. It, it just means, okay, we our, our path is easier, but we're not going to be able to compete with any of the teams that we, most of the teams that we play. And so that's, that was the long winded way of, of saying that. I know I said I had a couple of minutes and then the, the, this, this question, I, I wanted to give a little. Yeah. I yeah. Wanted. I mean, look at, at the end of the day, it's about long-term sustainability and regardless of who you are, and how, quote unquote, easy your path to the playoff is, you can't consistently operate at a 30, 40, 50 million dollar deficit year in and year out and expect to maintain the same level of athlete or the same level of success in your program. It's just not possible. You need money to stay at the top of college football. And that's exactly what these ACC teams don't have. Um, you can't. You just long term, you can't operate at that much of a deficit. You're going to fall behind. So that's what Clemson and FSU's mentality is, is we want to continue to operate at 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 or towards the top of the sport. And in order for us to do that, we can't operate at this deficit. So we need to get out. That was the simple decision that they made. Um, you know, whether you think they would be, you know, at the bottom of the SEC or at the bottom of the Big Ten. Uh, I don't think that's a that's a mute point like that. You know, this is about um, staying relevant. And in order to stay relevant in big time college football, you have to have money, at least similar money to the rest of the programs that are competing at or near the top. So, you know, maybe Clemson goes to the SEC and loses every game or maybe they go to the Big Ten and lose every game. Is that going to happen? No. Um, well, most SEC you know, people and most Big Ten homers or whatever you want to call them say that, you know, Clemson and Florida State aren't ready to compete in our conference. Of course, they're going to say that. Um, but again, once they make it to one of those conferences, the schedule will be they'll be made. The games will be played and we'll see where it goes. Yep. Uh, th that's 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 the end of the day. I mean, it, the, the I games guess. have to happen on the field. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, when that time comes. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, they'll talk up the conference, but Clemson and Florida State, you stick it, you stick either one of them in, in either conference, and they're immediately one of the top half, at worst, brands in, in either conference. Like, you, you can't tell me that, that you know, Ole Miss, is, Ole Miss is doing better numbers than, than Clemson. They're not. They're just not. Even, even being in the SEC, they're not doing better numbers. Like, I saw a comment that said, I saw another comment from SEC. I hope you were being sarcastic about that Vanderbilt comment because that's, <laughs> that's just blatantly not true. Yeah. Uh, Van, I, I can't remember the last time Vanderbilt has beaten an ACC team. They've, they've lost like five straight to Wake Forest. Like, let's be serious. Like the top, the, the top brands in the SEC absolutely are, are the, um, are much bigger than what, what the ACC has. Like, Yes, the Clemson. If Clemson and Florida State were to join the, the SEC, their their road absolutely does get tougher. Like, there's no oh, doubt yeah. about it. One hundred percent. The teams from top to bottom, from a quality standpoint, are better. But let's let's not like let's not like act like the whole conference is is better than anything that the Clemson has played in the ACC. Like, I'm not I'm not coming into the 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 SEC scared of Vanderbilt or or Mississippi <laughs> State. Like, Clemson. 
Clemson and Florida State will, if you throw them in either conference, will be one of the more talented teams. And and and, and then at the end of the day, it comes to it comes down to um, coaching, recruiting, especially at the line of scrimmage, which Clemson in, in has especially done really well, um, especially in the last couple of cycles. And obviously, defensive line they've they've always done really well. Um, and then Florida State, I think, is 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 taking that step too, and their their recruiting is is starting to ramp up now that they've kind of righted the ship a little bit. So I'm I'm just I don't buy this whole like the 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 road being tougher should not be a, a deterrent for either program as far as their their future prospects and where they feel like they need to be uh, to stay at the top of college football. It's not I'm not downplaying how how you know. I'm not downplaying the SEC. I'm not downplaying the Big Ten. But at the end of the day, like the the teams being tougher does not really doesn't move the needle as far as okay, maybe we should we should stay where we are. I don't think either fan base is is expecting to come in and win the same amount of games that they did in the the uh, the ACC. Like I don't. I w- if Clemson were to join the SEC tomorrow, I'm not saying. Oh, yeah, no, Clemson's going 11, 11 and 1, 12 and 0. Like, I, I mean, no, I don't, especially, I mean, I'd have to see the schedule, but I don't think anybody reasonable would predict that. But with the expanded playoff, it's not really going to, I think the expanded playoff makes it even more of an incentive to be like, well, we can lose a few games in the SEC and still probably get in because they're um, they're going to take up the majority of the spots in this expanded playoff to begin with. And there's a lot, there's more room for error now. Um, so I, I don't think there's any reason f- um, for Clemson and Florida State to to stay in the ACC for, from a competition standpoint. They're just it, it doesn't doesn't track like I, I don't the goal isn't to make the playoff. The goal is to I mean, it's one of the goals, but it's but that's not the end goal. It's like we're not happy with with making the playoff and then losing every year, losing in the first round every year. Like, but I mean, what what good does that do you? Right. So, I, I I get I gave it a totally long winded rant. But <laughs> I, just, I, I wanted to address that because that's a narrative. Like, and it's not just as, but I've heard that sentiment from a lot of fan bases about both programs, and they're just like, oh, they they don't know what they're getting into, and and all of that. And I'm just like, yeah. And I know they and they said it when Oklahoma and Texas joined for the, joined the SEC, and it's just like, I don't. The, the programs that care about winning and believe that they can win don't care about that kind of stuff. They're going to win regardless. Um, and that, yeah, does that mean some years Clemson is going to be leaner on wins? Are they going to, you know, sure. Maybe they only win eight, eight games uh, with an SEC schedule, but, uh, but, you know, when they're operating at their peak efficiency and when they, and they get, get the right team, like they're going to be one of the best teams in the conference. Same mm-hmm. with Florida state. They're, they're both good enough, on, you know, on their own to compete with those other programs in the SEC. Like, it, it's not like they have to play us, too. It's not just right. oh, we got to play. We got to play Bama. We got to play Georgia. We got to play LSU. Um, yeah, like they have to play. They have to play Florida State and Clemson, too. So yeah. it, it makes their their road tougher, too. Oklahoma, Texas, it's the same thing. So, I mean, I, I'm just okay. I, I, I've I've said enough. I said enough. Uh, no, no, no. You're good. <laughs> uh, I agree with everything you said. It's you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think Clemson would do um, pretty well in either one of those conferences. Um, you know. On, and on any given year, they could they could win those conferences. Um, I believe that's the quality of program that Clemson is. You know, you know, have we been as good as we were in 2018 for the past three seasons? No, absolutely not. But no. you know, they they Clemson also hasn't fell off a cliff. You know, no, we've had they're some still struggles. recruiting. They're we, still we, recruiting. I mean, at a at a high level. So it, yeah, I mean, we've 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 had some some tough seasons. We've had some. Some issues with injury, and we've taken, our standards. Tough yeah, we've our standards. we've we've taken a few steps back from where we were, but we're still in a in a very good position, and we can, you know, quickly get back, you know, if things go in the right direction. And I believe the right coaching hires have been made. Um, you know, I think we can trend back closer to 
um, where we were, you know, three, four short seasons ago, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think Clemson will compete in whatever conference they end up in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll we'll leave that there, Jordan. Yeah, um, that was a good way to good way to end it. Absolutely, some, some solidarity. Um, Appreciate SEC Dog for being in here. Yeah, shout out to you. I love SEC uh, Dog. That's my dude. So I just but I, I had to I had to call him out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all in good fun, man. That's uh absolutely. that's part of the thing that makes uh, college football so great is uh, all the different fan bases and the trash talk that goes back and forth and you know it's it's what makes it unique man um you know this don't this doesn't happen in the nfl like you know it's just it's, it's a, a different, different it's it, i mean it's it's a different vibe it's a different sport like it, it just i don't it doesn't compare um and you know this is, shows like this you know fan fans like uh, you know who we have here uh you just you don't find that anywhere else. Uh, no, that's that's not what at makes all. this. I mean, college football the best sport in, in the world. I just I wouldn't yeah. trade it for anything else. Yeah, it's 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 still by far the greatest sport. Um, as long as they don't mess it up. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're trying to. They're tr- they, they have been trying for a while, but yeah, uh, it's still it's still holding the title of of the best sport uh, ever created. So uh, I'll stand by that. Um, until it no longer is, but hopefully we never get to that day, but shout out to everyone for being in here tonight. Thank you guys so much for, for showing up, um, getting into the comment section, hanging out with me and Jordan for what's been over two hours at this point. I know we went pretty in depth when it comes to the spring game preview and, and, and breaking down uh, position group by position group. I think it was super important for, for us to do, and it made for a good conversation. But uh, spring game this Saturday, 1 p.m., keep in mind that uh, Mark Rogers and Jason Priester will be live on this channel 8 p.m. on Saturday following the spring game to give you guys a breakdown of everything that they saw. So make sure you guys show up for that and um, get into the comment section and and let them know what you guys thought about the spring game and and listen to them uh, break it down. And um, Jordan, go ahead and uh, send the people off and we'll get out of here. Uh, yeah, guys. Uh, once again, thank you guys for for tuning in. Um, we, we appreciate it that you guys keep showing up each and every week and, and giving us our support. We're almost at 5,000 subscribers for the channel. So um, I know you guys are, but um, if you know any other Clemson fans, college football fans in general, uh, share this show. It definitely helps. Uh, continue to hit that like button um, it's, as we continue to kind of uh, get the show out there to more people. Um, so uh, we really greatly appreciate it. And uh, we will be here uh, same time Thursday, next Thursday, 8 p.m. to kind of discuss all the all the happenings during the week and then obviously the spring game. Um we didn't get a chance to talk about recruiting. I saw somebody ask about that, um, but uh, we'll give a we'll we'll make up we'll make it up to y'all and kind of give a sort of a recap of, of some of the visitors and and kind of how uh, that went. So, um, uh, yeah, but that'll do it. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. All right, guys. Uh, next Thursday, eight p.m. right here at the Voice of College Football Clemson Channel. Until next time, I'm Tiger Paul Craven. He's Jordan Bowman. Go Tigers. Later, y'all.